Okay, well, I am someone better. <laughs> and they're confused right now. They are worried <laughs> and they are totally worried. They have no I idea. Have to, I'm I'm to say, you know, it could be like it might be. Yeah, yeah. I, have I, not seen it. It. I have not seen it for a few hours. <laughs> Drinking heavily, you exactly. What did I do? You do have to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. This is for being a lawyer. So, being a lawyer, he so it makes so much sense to be a lawyer. He was all the way up This goes after the six years of staying in the county. It's the same family. Let's go ahead and take our seats and we'll get started. I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. And with roll call, we'll start with Zoom attendees. Uh, Robert Radigan. I'm here. Lisa Curtis. Present. Ryan Cangelosi. Here. Joaquin Sanchez. Present. Michael Sanchez. I'm here. Christopher Salcedo. Here. And I'm Ed Chavez, so we have all seven members of the committee here. As far as uh, opening remarks, I do not have a whole lot to say today. We, we have a full agenda. I just want to remind people that we have already had our first round of eight meetings where we obtained public input about communities of interest and also how you would like to see your dist districts drawn. Based on that public input, we drew some concepts that research and polling will show you today. If any of you have maps that you brought with you or want us to display so that you can present to the committee, you're welcome to do that. Uh, just let us know which map it is. Uh, I do not have a time limit on how long you can speak, but I ask you to respect the fact that there are a lot of people who do want to speak today. And if you have something to say that has already been repeated by somebody, there's nothing wrong with saying, I agree with what so-and-so said. I will record that in the summary of testimony. With that, uh, we are honored by the presence of Dr. Charles McNell Sr. And he was gonna make a presentation to us today. Please. Well, I, I want to thank you all for <clears throat> having me here this afternoon. As you know, I am a Baptist preacher. They gave me 30 minutes. And you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll adhere to that. But it's it's going to be hard. I think the, uh, the instructions I got was to talk about African Americans in New Mexico. And first of all, I'd like to say that we've always had a presence here in New Mexico. Uh, even though our numbers may have been small, we have had a presence. Now, I grew up in Hobbs, New Mexico. And growing up in Hobbs, I grew up around politics, whether it was uh, civil rights, desegregation, our politicians coming into the Hobbs community to get votes. Uh, I just, when I look around the state, in Hobbs, there was two reasons why people, African Americans came to Hobbs. The first reason was there was an air base in Hobbs, a military base years ago. And uh, most of the men that African Americans who were at the base, some of them stayed in Hobbs. The other reason was 
Tom's was a boom town. And you had uh, individuals moving in the hubs, and they got very wealthy in the oil fields, in the oil business. And that wealth brought them to the point where they didn't want to clean their houses anymore. They didn't want to mow their lawns anymore. They didn't want to pick their vegetables to cut. So African Americans start to move in the hubs to get those kinds of jobs. The same is true in Clovis, military base, Alamogordo, military base, and Albuquerque, uh, military base. Many of those people stayed in New Mexico. The railroad played a big influence because you had a pocket of African Americans in Raton and all the way Albuquerque down to Belize. So we've always been here, but even before that, uh, out at the Zuni Pueblo, they will tell you today that the first white man they saw was black. His name was Estebanito, and he led the Spanish expedition into New Mexico. Pueblo Revolt. An African American uh, black person uh, was very instrumental in participating in that Pueblo revolt. Um, cowboys in New Mexico, one of the most noted cowboys was George McTuckin, who resided in Las Vegas and he founded the Pulsar Man, which is the oldest. Dallas or whatever man that uh, uh, in, in, the, in the nation. One of the oldest chapters of the NAACP was founded right here in Albuquerque. Uh, I think it was the third chapter ever uh, that ever existed was in New Mexico. And there was a man by the name of Abraham Lincoln Mitchell who uh, was instrumental in getting that chapter of the NAACP started. One of the most noted figures we had in New Mexico was uh, Ralph Bunch, who went on to be the, I forget what he was, big shot <laughs> in government, uh, but Ralph Bunch was uh, UNN secretary, I believe it was. Um, there was a group of African Americans who came from Georgia. They walked all the way from Georgia to Roswell, New Mexico. And they brought a contingent with them and they founded a town called Blackdom. And the remains of Black Blackdom are still in, outside of Roswell. That community, they, it was thriving for a while, but they ran out of water. And they moved the town to Vado, New Mexico, which is right outside of Las Cruces. And Vado is still in existence today. When I was growing up, uh, Lee County, Chavez County, Curry County, Eddy County, uh, they were all segregated. I went to a segregated school. And one of the, the, I guess, when I went to that segregated school, I tell people the first six grades of my uh, school years, I had all black teachers. When I went, when they integrated the schools and I went to uh, junior high school, from junior high school to high school to college, all the way to my PhD, I never saw another black teacher. They were all white. Segregated exist, segregation existed, and I'm gonna use Hobbs as an example, Lee County. They would pick up children in Tatum, New Mexico, which is 45, 50 miles from Hobbs. Five students would be put on the school bus. They would stop in Leventon and they would drop those kids off at the Hobbs segregated school. 
So those kids had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get on the bus. But Tatum has come a long way because right now they got a black sheriff in Tatum who happens to be a female. So we've come a long way. An interesting story, uh, I used to caddy uh, at the Hobbs Country Club and they wouldn't allow me to use the bathroom. If I had to use the restroom, I had to go down into a ditch and relieve myself. And that was as late as 1962-63. And I did a training session for the Hobbs Police Department in 2006. And it was so successful, they called me back for more. But the last session, the mayor called me. He said, look, I want to take you to lunch. He took me to lunch at the Hobbs Country Club. And I said, I don't know if I want to do this, but since he didn't invite me, I went. And I said, you know, that was a time I could see the end of these doors. But at that meeting, at that luncheon, they presented me with the key to the city. You know, we've come a long way. Hobbs has had a black chief of police, a black mayor who was elected twice, school board member, county commissioner, uh, city council. Hobbs has come a long way. But segregation existed in Roswell. And I don't know if you all know this, but in Roswell, they had a uh, semi-protein in Roswell. And Willie Stargell, who played for the Pittsburgh Pirates, played for that team in Roswell. Uh, Any County was segregated, Donahue County, Alamogordo. Um, those were all segregated schools. When they integrated the schools, we had a tough time because when we got off the bus uh, at the school when I was in junior high school, when we got off the bus, they, uh, the white kids taunted us, threatened us, but we held our own and we worked through it. In New Mexico, they say the black population is three to five percent of the population. And I think this is important for us to understand. Even though we're a small number, and we've been treated that way because the small number means that we've been overlooked in the past. And we've been taken for granted by the political uh, parties in New Mexico. But I tell you, our greatest asset as African Americans in New Mexico is our influence. Now, I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. Um, but in terms of political achievements, I remember growing up, my dad was very involved in politics. Politicians would come by his house, come by our house, put up their signs, they'd have a barbecue, they'd bring red sodas, we call it soda pop. And they break beer and watermelon and uh, make a little spill, spill. And we'd never see them again until four years later. They took us for granted. Um, we had signs all over our yard and in other yards and homes. But something miraculous happened. We said, okay, we're not selling our boats anymore for barbecue. We're not selling our boats anymore for the red soda pop and the watermelon. And you come in and we don't see you again. We began to hold these politicians accountable. And what we wanted from them was, we wanted jobs in our community. This is about economic development in our community. We want jobs, we wanted access to programs, and we found that 
when we asked for something, white people never gave us what we asked for, what we needed. They gave us what they wanted us to have. And it was always not enough. Um, we've had uh, three black mayors that I know of in New Mexico, one in Hobbs, one in uh, Las Cruces, and one in Corrales. And I could name them for you if you'd like. But in Hobbs, we had a black chief of police named Jimmy Palmer. And let me just tell you a little story about Jimmy Palmer. When I was in high school, Jimmy was a, a parole, a patrol officer. Uh, you know, whites didn't want to come and patrol the, the black community, so they hired a black person to do that. We were going to start a little game called the Black Hawks. And we were having a meeting down at the community center, about five or six of us. And we were sitting there talking about what we're going to do, and Jimmy Palmer walks in. And he said, let me tell you guys something. There's only one black hawk in Hobbs, and that's me. That was the end of our game. <laughs> um, I mentioned that we had the sheriff in Tatum. Uh, we've had five or six black state legislators. Uh, two blacks have won statewide office that I know of. We've had four blacks who served on county commissioners, commissioners throughout the state. Um, and we've had numerous school board members, one in Rio Rancho, and I know another one in Hobbs. I guess our greatest level of influence was uh, with the election of James Lewis. The black community had a slogan in 1982 called Coming Through and during that period, we encouraged African Americans to run for political office. And they were encouraged, and several Blacks ran for office. But James, that's when he launched his uh, campaign for office. As you know, he's been county treasurer, city manager. He's held a number of positions, and we're very proud of James Lewis. Um, but to illustrate our influence, we had that slogan coming through in 82. Uh, how did they get elected? We don't have enough uh, votes to elect somebody locally, but we can be an influence. And let me tell you how this played out. And uh, I believe it was 75, Jerry Apodaca ran for governor. We got behind Jerry Apodaca. We didn't elect him. I'm not saying black folks elected him, but he won by what, 3,600 votes? Bruce King. His margin, the last election he won was very narrow. Bruce King, David King called me and said, Charles, we need your help. The black community is not responding to Bruce. And I said, okay, I'm a good Democrat, I'll go help. And I went throughout the state campaigning for Bruce King. He won by uh, even slimmer margin than Jerry Abadak. We didn't like Bruce King, but we were an influence. How does this influence make out? Well, each one of us who are registered voters, we know people who are not African Americans, who we have influence with. And we, this one vote may turn into 10, 12, 20 votes. This is how our influence pays out. So we no longer want to be neglected. We want a place at the table. Uh, so statewide elections is where we have our greatest influence. I did a little assessment on the number of votes that we could put together around the state of New Mexico. 
and we have contacts in each one of those areas. Whereas our influence may be minimal in local elections, it's pretty doggone strong in statewide elections. And we all need to overlook that, don't dilute that influence that we have. We want a place at the table. We, as African Americans, got together, I can't remember the year, but there was a vacancy on the city council in Albuquerque. And we talked to all of our friends and we went to the mayor, Harry Kennedy, and we said, we want an African American to fill this position, city council. And he appointed Dr. Saul Brown, a Republican, to that commission, council. So you see the influence that we had. I remember also we wanted a park built in Southeast Albuquerque, Kirkland Edition. And one of the, I'm not going to call any names, but he was chairman of the city, it was city commission at that time. He said, over my dead body was that be a, a, a park built in that community. Well, if you drive down University Boulevard to the end of it, you'll see a park called Kirkland Park. So we as African Americans are influential in elections. We don't want to be left out. We know uh, what we need to do and when we need to do it. But the cities with the greatest numbers of African Americans, Albuquerque, Clovis, Hobbs, Roswell, Alamogordo. But the second tier, Carlsbad, Gallup, Rio Rancho, Silver City, Artesia, and Tucumcari. We got African Americans spread out all over the state of New Mexico. And we know each other. And if we don't know each other, we know how to get to each other. So when you're drawing these districts up, please keep in mind that we need and want and even demand a seat at the table. So I'll stop here if anybody has any questions. Uh, but if you want to know more about Blacks in New Mexico, this is my book. <laughs> no challenge, no change. And my number is 280-0232. Anybody want a copy, we'll get it to you. But if you want to know the status and the, the background of African Americans in this state, it's here. It's not too complimentary to some politicians, but the truth is the truth. And this is what we see as African Americans. Anybody have any questions? Questions? Dr. Bechdel, thank you very much. We appreciate you being here for time frame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't cut that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Now, thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 okay, the next item on the agenda, we will go through congressional district maps, then we will receive public comment, both in person and on Zoom, and then we will be set. The reason I'm going to do that is selfish reasons that helps me organize the summaries that I prepare for the website. So with that, Ryan, are you ready? Ready, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you very much. If I may, it's a point of personal privilege to say it's a great honor for me to be sitting next to Dr. Charles Becknell. We worked together many decades ago in my relative youth on some projects, and so it's a great honor to be here. Okay, congressional concepts. 
So as you know, we have posted seven congressional concepts up to this point. And as we travel the state, we tend to limit our focus to the region that we're visiting uh, to uh, focus on that. So here we are, of course, today in Albuquerque. Um, just to remind everybody, there are three congressional districts during the census. We did not gain or lose any congressional districts. So the ideal population of a district after the 2020 census was or is 705,000 people, 841. So basically, what does that mean? It means if you take the population of the state, you divide it by three districts, that's the ideal population of a congressional district. For all of these districts that we'll be looking at and concepts, the deviation in population among the districts calculates out to 0.0%. In other words, they're almost identical. Some of them vary by 10 people, some by 80 people. Um, currently, in New Mexico, uh, we have, in those three districts, a northern-based district, an Albuquerque-based district, and a southern-based district. Again, we're here in Albuquerque today, so we focus on that. Burleo County does not have sufficient population to have a wholly contained congressional district. Um, so it must be included with some additional population from other counties. Now that's assuming that you go with the status quo oriented plan. And so let's quickly go over these different concepts because some of them are the same as it relates to Albuquerque. The first one, um, has those three core districts that we talked about, the North, the South, and, and, and Albuquerque. And so in the Albuquerque or Berlio County-based district, we continue to have since the status quo oriented, Torrance County, Placitas, the town of Berlio, and Sandy and Pueblo. So the Albuquerque area includes those as well. Uh, Edgewood uh, is also uh, included in the first congressional district. Now, in the current congressional districts, Edgewood is in, but it's split. We heard lots of testimony along the way to keep Edgewood uh, wholly contained with the district. So here, here it is, as well as Torrance County. The second congressional concept, again, Bernalillo County, since it's status quo oriented, the Torrance County, Placitas, and Bernalillo. Um, one change in this Albuquerque metro area is that Isleta is in CD1 under this plan. And Edgewood, notice, is out. Edgewood goes with the northern district because then that keeps Santa Fe County intact in the northern district. So Isleta in, Edgewood goes north, that would be one. Uh, big difference in the plans. Congressional concept C is very similar to the others as it relates to Albuquerque, so we can pass up on it. Now, one very big different plan that uh, we want to share is concept D. In concept D, Albuquerque is actually with Santa Fe. And so it includes Albuquerque and much of the East Mountains. Edgewood, Moriarty, and uh, Santa Fe. Another component of this plan is that most of the core of the second and third congressional districts are retained if we take a zoom out. However, much of the east side is unified. Um, you know, if you recall that eastern New Mexico typically is divided north and south, but in this case, Union County um, and some of the other uh, areas bordering the Texas Oklahoma border are included in the second congressional district. If we go to concept E, we see here another different than the status quo in that it's more of an urban Albuquerque Rancho district. So Albuquerque with Rio Rancho. Basically, the second congressional district has retained its core in southern New Mexico. But one big difference in this plan 
is it's a very urban Albuquerque Rio Rancho because the unincorporated areas of the South Valley are included in the second congressional district. During the CRC hearings throughout the state, in some areas, you heard people testify that the South Valley might share more in common with Vegeta and Berlin and Los Lunas and Anthony and Sunland Park than it does with Tenor. So this particular plan um, is an effort to demonstrate what would happen if the unincorporated areas of the South Valley were included in the second congressional district. Notice that Siebel goes north, and as a result of that, Tahajali is able to be, uh, uh, excuse me, as Tahajali as well as Alamo are able to go into the, the northern district. One side effect, though, of this plan is that Lincoln County needs to go into the northern district to accommodate for the fact that the South Valley and its population made the second congressional district too large. Now, there are other plans that were shown during your hearings, and there are other plans to come uh, that also put the South Valley with the South. Those plans uh, also do different things to Albuquerque and to the North, and so we'll, we'll wait on those. These are the ones that have been published so far. Congressional District F, the next one, also has an urban Albuquerque Rio Rancho district. So not with the South Valley, just an urban Albuquerque Rio Rancho district. Notice how the East Mountains uh, go, a little more rural in nature, go with the Northern Congressional District. Ajali and Alamo, Native American uh, areas, uh, uh, go with the Northern District. And then finally, concept G. Uh, this one, Valencia Cultural put it on the district or website using 2010 population. We thought it was intriguing enough to show. We updated it to 2020 population and uh, had to tweak it as a result. Uh, but all three congressional districts retained their core. However, the Northern District and CD3 is concentrated more in North Central and Northwestern. Uh, New Mexico, and part of the east side uh, stays with the second congressional district. In Albuquerque and CD1, it's mostly at Albuquerque and most of Rio Rancho. And now for the first time, notice Corrales under this plan. is actually so it becomes an Albuquerque Corrales Rio Rancho um, district. Uh, another unique thing about this plan um, uh, is that notice that the Albuquerque district is sort of, sort of a donut within the state, which is allowed, uh, but it, it, it falls within the other two districts. So that would be a quick uh, summary of the congressional plans, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brian. Any questions from the committee for Brian? Mr. Chairman, just one quick question. Brian, on that last concept. Pull your mic closer, sir. On that last concept. Uh, Albuquerque is the donut in the middle, and CP3 goes around it. Yeah. Into Valencia County. Yeah. So okay. under this plan, uh, CD1 is a donut uh, within CD3, and Valencia County is in the Northern District, as well as this led to Tahajali, Alamo. And then this that's part of Socorro County as well. Uh, just the part that's in Alamo and Nano right there, which is the Southwestern Socorro County, because of the adjacency to Cibola, we were able to unify the Native Americans in that Northern District in this plan with this led up and the uh, Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yeah, that is one of the few where you see Valencia County. I see the Any other questions? Okay, let's go to public comment. Our first speaker is Andrea Serrano. Um, while we're in Andrea, sorry.
Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Andrea Serrano. I'm the Executive Director at OLE here in Albuquerque. I was born and raised here in Albuquerque in the neighborhood of Budanes, and um, I now live here in the South Valley, actually, but I just live on the other side of the world. I'm here today to show support for both uh, Concept Map E for the State House, as well as uh, the Congressional Map, the People's Map, submitted by Melanie Aranda. Map E preserves House District 28 and House District 19, and it makes a commitment to incre increase the voting power of both Black voters and Asian and Pacific Islander voters. Um, it, it's worth noting that both Pamela Herndon, State, State Representative Pamela Herndon and State Representative Kay Bunkwa, one from 28, one from 19, um, are, rep are representing a very underrepresented groups. It's very underrepresented groups in our state. There are a lot of Latino and Chicano and Hispanic lawmakers who represent in the state rep in the state legislature. Very few black legislators and even less Asian uh, legislators. And I'm not saying that preserving these districts is an automatic win for these legislators, but I think especially because they've just both been appointed this year, it would be a travesty to eliminate those districts before they have the chance to even do work for those districts. It's also a travesty to weaken the power of both Black voters and Asian and Pacific Islander voters. The People's Map, which is a congressional map, um, uh, again, submitted by Melanie Aranda, creates equity across the state by moving the South Valley into Congressional District 2. Albuquerque is not a monolith, and you've heard us say this at every hearing, uh, we say it over and over, because it isn't. I grew up in Duranes, which is a near North Valley. I now live here in the South Valley. A couple of weeks ago, I had to go way up into Wyoming and Paseo, completely different areas of town with very different needs. And so to have the entire city of Albuquerque crammed into one congressional district means that the needs of people, particularly in the South Valley, aren't being met. The South Valley has more in common with rural areas in CD2 than it does with the heights in CD1. Um, when we talk about representation, it's vital that, it, that representation remains diverse and it honors our different needs. CD2 is a better fit for the South Valley, which is a majority Latino, Chicano, Hispanic district. Moving the South Valley into CD2 will increase the voting age population of Latino voters creating more equity and visibility. As a state, New Mexico has the opportunity to be exceptional when it comes to redistricting. We're seeing travesties happen all across the country and the disenfranchisement of voters of color all across the country. And New Mexico has this opportunity to actually increase in three congressional districts uh, the, the, the power and the representation of people of color. And that's why I'm here today supporting the People's Map and House, um, House Map. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Any questions from the committee? Brian, can you zoom in? How many ways is Albuquerque split? I can't see that. Okay. Well, there's Are there questions for Andrea? Oh, Brian. Mr. Chairman, so we see basically the South Valley and the Ladera area, um, most of it, not all of it, going into the second congressional district, but to answer your question twice, uh, the heights of Albuquerque and the west side, the North Valley would be in Canusa Valley, in congressional district. Just zoom out so we can see. So Albuquerque is what's called here a number three. Can you zoom out a little? Yeah, so Albuquerque would be uh, with Chavez, with Roswell and uh, Lincoln County. And then this a lot of the west side uh, and the South Valley would be in the second congressional district. So if I'm thinking representative, you've got uh, 
I just had the punch moment there. There's the ledger going down south. And you've got Stansbury being in the north. Is that right? Santa Fe goes down and includes Clovis, and it looks like North Isles, maybe. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Mr. Chair, this is on or not? Yes. So I guess, and Mr. Sander, a question. So, as you as you've said in the past, Brian, that the first one that you change changes the number. I'm just trying to figure out on this map. So, is three one, one three, and two still two? Well, there are enough changes in this map that you could probably put different numbers on it. We think of one as Albuquerque, but we think of two as the south, we think of three as the north. Um, it could have said three where the one is, it could have swapped the numbers. Uh, but since there's sufficient enough change in all the districts, it's, uh, this was their choice. But uh, more of what we call three, they're calling one. I guess we need to know if it was intentional on your part, right? Otherwise, you have to repaint. Well, there are a lot of times where maps change a lot, but you have options as to which numbers you assign. I think that's a, a minor issue. It's always a point of confusion when we have major changes in legislative districts about whether to call it House 17 or 15, because there's a lot of change within it. So, um, but one could call that one a three if one liked, and one could call their th they're three or one. Uh, it's just uh, semantics. So, from a population standpoint, is that? Uh, we see 705, 808, and 705, 904, and 705, 810. So, uh, they're very close on population. All right. Um, thanks for the explanation. Next, we have Maria Buenas tardes, miembros del comité. Mi nombre es Mariana Barrete, soy miembro de OLED, condado de Hernández. Yo estoy aquí, apoyo también el mapa E y el mapa de la gente. Yo quiero ser parte de la minoría mayoría. Good evening, my name is Mariana Barrete. Good evening, my name is Maria Navarrete. I am a community member with OLE, and I'm here to support Map E and the People's Map. I want to be part of the majority minority district. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Josefina Gallardo. Buenas tardes, presidente y miembros del comité. Mi nombre es Josefina Gallardo y soy miembro de OLE. Yo apoyo el mapa E porque protege HD28. Yo vivo allá. Y el mapa de la gente. Para mí es importante que me cuenten sin preguntar mi estatus migratorio. Los presupuestos deben de ser bien representados justamente para las comunidades de gente trabajadora. My name is uh, Josie Gallardo, uh, as a member of OLE, and I'm here to support Map E because it upholds H E 28, uh, and I live there. I also am here to support the People's Map. Um, I want to be counted with all my immigration status being asked for. 
Um, the budgets should uh, should represent uh, the communities in a just way, and they should be representing the working people if we want to be a part of a large uh, change. I invite you to be part of the minority majority. Thank you. Next, we have Rosalinda Dorada. Hello, my name is Rosalinda Dorado. I am an organizer with El Centro Igualdad y Derechos. I am here in favor of the concept of House Map D and People's Map for Congressional Map. As a leading organizer for El Centro Igualdad y Derechos for the 2020 Census campaign, the Centro worked hard with allies and community leaders to get out the camp and organize our members to take lead in becoming experts on the subject to be able to educate and inform our communities about the importance of getting counted for the 2020 census. We knocked and called thousands of Albuquerque residents for the unincorporated area of, in the South Valley to ensure the federal dollars flow to all our communities and that we have a fair represent, uh, redistricting process despite all of the barriers that were happening. But now we are here fighting to ensure that our communities are not erased from the maps. We are here to create a change for our communities. For the first time ever, we can have majority minority congressional districts with over 55% minority Hispanics of voting age. We need to stop failing and making excuses for minority communities. Don't have equal opportunities and start actually taking action, even if it seems drastic, to ensure that our people, our government, ha who has marginalized for decades, can have equal opportunities to thrive. Thank you. Any of the members have questions? <coughs> no. Next we have Ms. Alana Mendoza. Hi, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Alma Mendoza y soy miembro del Centro de Igualdad de Derechos. Estoy aquí en favor del concepto de People Map, el mapa de la gente en el Instituto Congresional y el mapa E de la Casa. Mi familia y yo hemos vivido por décadas en el Valle del Sur. El Valle del Sur ha sido excluido de muchos recursos y oportunidades. No contamos con banquetas parques, alumbrado público, hospitales y las calles están en muy mal estado. Y hemos visto cómo el gobierno ha ignorado al Valle del Sur. Nos hicimos contar en el censo y vamos a luchar por ser contados en estos mapas. Es hora de fortalecer los distritos de la minoría en todo el estado y tener por primera vez un distrito congresional de mayoría en las minorías con más del 55% de hispanos en edad de votar. Gracias. Hi, my name is Alma Mendoza and I'm a member of the Centro de Igualdad y Derechos. I'm here in favor of the People's Maps concept for the congressional district and map E for the House of Representatives. My family and I have lived in the East South Valley um, during many decades, the South Valley has been excluded from receiving resources and opportunities. We don't have sidewalks, parks, public lighting, hospitals, and the roads are in bad conditions. We have lived, we have seen how the government has ignored the South Valley. We made ourselves be counted in the census, and we are going to fight to be counted in these maps. It is time to strengthen our minority districts in the entire state and to, for the first time, have a majority congressional district that includes my that is composed of at least 
55% of minorities, um, including more than 55% of Hispanics uh, uh, above voting age. Thank you. Next, we have Norma Mendoza. Norma Mendoza. Hola, buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Norma Mendoza, soy miembro del Centro de Igualdad y Derecho. Estoy aquí en favor del concepto eh, el mapa de la gente para el distrito congresional y el mapa E de la casa. Mi familia y yo hemos vivido en el Valle del Sur por décadas con mis hijos. Hemos visto cómo el gobierno nos ha ignorado. Perdón. Aquí en el Valle del Sur. Los recursos nunca llegan a nuestras comunidades. Por esta razón, yo y mi familia tomamos el papel importante para organizar a nuestra comunidad en el Censo 2020 para asegurar que nuestras comunidades de minorías fueran contadas y ahora estamos aquí para asegurarnos que no seamos borrados del mapa. Es hora de fortalecer los distritos de las minorías en todo el estado y tener por primera vez un distrito congresional de la mayoría en la, de mayoría en las minorías con más del 55% de hispanos en edad para votar. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, for the congressional district and for Matt e for the House of Representatives. My family and I have lived in the South Valley for many decades with my children. We have seen how the government has ignored the South Valley. The resources never, uh, never reach our communities. For this reason, my family and I have taken the important role of organizing our community in the Census 2020 to ensure that our communities, our minority communities are counted and Today, we are here to ensure that we are not erased from the map. It is meant to strengthen the minority districts in the entire state and to have a congressional district for the first time, um, a majority congressional district that is composed of minorities with more than 55% of Hispanic voters, voters with, uh, within voting range. Next, we have Fabiola Landeros. Buenas tardes. Um, my name is Fabiola Tanderos. I'm an organizer with the Centro de Valle Derecho. I'm here in favor of concept of House Map E and People's Map for Congressional Map. As an organizer of the Centro, we work hand in hand with our communities to ensure that our New Mexican families can prosper and thrive. But we can do it if our communities keep getting in power and erased from the maps. New Mexico has failed or New Mexican minority communities, and for other reasons, we felt it's important to come here and voice our concern and goals to create a change. It's time to strengthen minority majority district across the, across the state and have, for the first time, have a majority minority congressional district. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Mirna Lozano. Still not here. Okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, next, we have Alina Castellar. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine. <laughs> Um, I had come to you before to express how I want to support a congressional map that kind of represents the South Valley where I live. And I believe the people's map represents that because it will put us together with the congressional district too. A district that I believe shows the South Valley, shows areas that I live in that have a similar culture and people's language. And I want that to be represented. So I hope today you listen to all of us and you consider the people's map as a map that could represent all that people a little better. Thank you. Next we have Michaela Gallegos.
Good afternoon. My name is Michaela Gallegos. I'm with New Mexico Working Families. And we are here in support of the People's Map, the Congressional Map, and House Map B. E. We believe that voters should vote their values and elect leaders who represent their communities, look like their communities, and come from their communities. That is why we are asking that the People's Map, Congressional Map, be um, adopted as a concept map and support House E. It was drawn with the input of the communities, the communities of interest, and that's what the communities want. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Next, we have Fernanda Banda. Good afternoon, everybody, members of the committee. My name is Fernanda, and I'm the advocacy organizer with the New Mexico Dream Team, as well as part of the Our People's Power is Our People's Mass Campaign. I migrated to the U.S. back in 1998 and have lived in New Mexico ever since. I just recently moved to the west side of Albuquerque, but for the majority of my life, I lived in the South Valley with my family. A lot of my community, my gente, lives in the South Valley. I have family members there who plan on contributing to the South Valley for the rest of their, their days as it is their home. Um, the South Valley has been classified as the 10th largest town in New Mexico. I just want to uplift a lot of what others have said. I too support the, the CCP People's Map and Mapa de la Gente Congressional Map to be adopted as the CRC concept map. It's time for my people to have a, a Hispanic majority district and to exercise our power. And Mapa de la Gente is the right direction to move forward with redistricting. Thank you. Some of you indicated um, which map you wanted to speak about. So if there's anybody else who wanted to speak about the congressional map, that's your opportunity. Excellent. My name is Jesse Lopez. I've been a lifelong uh, member of the South Valley, right off Uh I don't want to, I'm not uh, speaking for Matt E. B is fine with me. I just don't see what we have in common with Las Cruces or the little towns, TRC or something. Uh, I just don't see it. I like being in. Uh, District 1 or whatever district that is. And I've been voting since I was 18. And I, I just got to tell these people they need to go out and vote every election and local ones too. Thank you. My name is Jesse Lopez. Next, we have Ms. Alicia Baldonado. Hello, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Alicia Maldonado, and I'm here today to speak in support of the People's Map um, submitted by Melanie Aranda for the Center for Civic Policy. I was born and raised in the community of Atrisco uh, here in the South Valley. My family uh, was part of the original Atrisco land grant. So we've been in this community um, for many generations, right? Since before it was even the United States. Um, I come from a family that is of mixed heritage. Um, on my father's side, the Atrisco heritage was from my, my grandmother, but uh, his grandmother was also Apache, and so we were mixed um, and have grown up in this valley region um, for many, many generations. My mother's family comes from Lincoln County, from southern New Mexico. And there are actually many families that are from southern New Mexico that moved north to uh, settle uh, in this Rio Grande Valley in Albuquerque uh, to find work, to work for the railroads, to find a better life whenever their communities were struggling. Um, and so that is also part of my heritage. I still have family in Parisoso, in Reventon, um, in, in those particular areas. And a short story about my grandfather, Amado Lueras. His family had a ranch in Reventon, right outside of Parisoso, up in the mountains. 
And when he went off to fight in World War II, was during the time that the United States government started to tax many families with property taxes and other sorts of uh, taxes, and they were putting deeds on property. Well, they kept doing this to my, my great grandparents who didn't speak English. When my father came back from the war, our family had lost everything because they hadn't paid taxes. They didn't pay these deeds, they didn't know how. This is a very common story for many people in New Mexico. So the gentleman who just said we don't have a lot in common with the South, I disagree with. We actually have a lot in common. They didn't start paving the streets in the South Valley until I was in middle school. And I know because I walked the dirt streets. I drive home right now. I still live right behind Rio Grande High School. There are no sidewalks in my community. Uh, we don't have uh, good infrastructure. Our schools suffer. Um, we, we have really had to fight for everything uh, in the South Valley. We're like a poor stepchild. So I don't care what number you call it. You can call it one, three, two. I'm more interested in access, in equity, in representation. I support the People's Map. I support the South Valley being part of uh, Congressional District 2. And I urge you all to consider the stories and the testimony that you have heard tonight. I thank you for your time. Next speaker is Melanie Aranda, and I'm going to ask folks if you're comfortable to take off your mask. It'll just make it easier for the committee to hear. If you're not comfortable, we respect that too. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Commission. Thank you. That was my sister, Alicia. Um, I am here. So I'm Melanie Aranda. I am a bounty member of the Center for Civic Policy and the Chief Operating Officer. And I am here to support the People's Map that I submitted this morning. I request the CRC Chair and the Honorable Members to adopt the map I submitted to become one of the CRC concept maps and move forward to other folks so that other folks can refer to it in these communities such as Hobbs, Roswell, Sunland Park, Anthony, Chaparral, and Las Cruces. Thank you. Next, we have Itziana Banda. Good afternoon, everyone and members of the committee. My name is Itziana Banda. I am a member with the New Mexico Dream Team. As part of the People's Power is People's Map campaign, I stand here in strong support of the CCP People's Map, El Mapa de la Gente Congresional. Sorry, as a resident of the South Valley, I do not for CCP People's Map El Mapa de la Gente Congresional to be adopted as CRC concept map. I was a key have in the 2020 census, and my goal back then was to make sure my community was counted and not ignored. And now I'm here to make sure my community is still counted in the maps and not ignored. It's time to strengthen minority districts across the state and for the first time have a minority majority congressional district with over 55% minority Hispanics that have the age to vote. Thank you. Next we have Alicia Samudio, S-A-M-U-D-I-O. Um, good afternoon, everyone, members of the committee. My name is Lucia Zamudio, and I am a member with the Dream New Mexico Dream Team as part of the People's Power and People's Map campaign. I stand here in strong support of the CCP, People's Map, El Mapa, El Mapa de la Gente Congressional Map. And as a resident of the South Valley, I demand for CCP, People's Map, El Mapa de la Gente Congressional Map to be adopted as CRC concept map. Thank you. Next we have Alyssa Banuelos.
Hi. Hello. Um, can everybody hear me? Sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Willows, and I'm an organizer of the Oxford Dream Team. So we have the campaign. And I just want to say that I stand with the CCP, um, La Gente, um, Congressional Map. And I guess pretty much all it is is I'm ready for the South Valley to be stained. <laughs> Next is Robin Carion. Hello, everyone. Hello, members of the board. My name is Robin Carion. Uh, my family migrated here from Mexico in the 90s, and most of my family lives in the South Valley, as well as I do. And I also have family members of the Berlin and Muslim. I'm here because I wholeheartedly support the CCP. The CCP, <coughs> sorry, El Mapa de la Gente Congressional Map to be adopted as the CRC concept map. I I believe that the South Valley shares a lot more in common with cities like Berlin and Las Vegas than it does with Albuquerque, and I believe this map will support um, the citizens of the South Valley. Thank you. And just a little reminder of folks, um, don't mind taking off their mask to be clearer and then getting up and speaking into the mic closely. That would be awesome. The next person is Eileen Martinez. Hello, everyone. Hello. Right. Hi, my name is Eileen Martinez. Um, I am a student at Highlands to become a social worker and I live in the South Valley and I'm just here in support with the CCP People's Map and Mapa, El Mapa de la Gente and the Congressional Maps and just that the CD, um, that we, the South Valley gets represented and then it's time that the, that the majority Hispanic people get, we get represented, right? We're all, we're seeing that we're, the majority is Hispanic and that we're growing and change is happening. And we're all here um, using our voices. We're all playing a part in this. So we ask that we get heard and we get represented and that we all, that we all, that we play the role in being represented. And so thank you so much. Is there anybody else who's interested in speaking about this congressional map? Hi, my name is Shirley Yalibad. I'm a Filipino American and I've immigrated here since I was age 17. I was a former juvenile probation officer with CYFD and a care coordinator for managed care organization. I am here on behalf of the Mexico Asian Family Center as now the new ending gender based violence coordinator. I'm hoping here to support also Map E. There are lots of means that needs to be addressed and as a community and as a village, I also wanted to honor the solidarity and the support that we have with, with our Latino community. October is Filipino History Month and Heritage Month, and we are celebrating all of the issues and support the services that are in need in our communities that we both share and the struggles that we share. Thank you for having us. Next, we have Anna Bondari. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna, and I am. I am a Nepali American here in New Mexico, and I am also with the New Mexico. Asian Family Center. I am the youth coordinator there, and I am here to support the People's Map and um, Map Concept E. I think it's really important that we uplift our communities, and we don't want our voices to be erased. So I am here in support of that. Thank you.
Next, we have Sunandita Santana. Hi, everyone. I'm Sunandita Santana. I'm here with the New Mexico Asian Family Center, and I am a South Asian woman. Um, I'm a student at UNM. And I'm here in support of the People's League and MAP Concept E um, because I feel like equity and representation is super important. And um, that's all I've ever wanted, even growing up. And so to see that we're making or trying to make such a big change here today is really inspirational. And I really hope you guys consider it. So thank you so much. Next, we have Wu Lin. Hi, my name is Hu Nguyen again, and thank you for, uh, for letting me to speak, uh, uh, chair and members of the committee and everyone. Um, we all know the fact that New Mexico um, is only uh, is one of the only six majority minority states, right? I mean, um, I didn't know that when I first came, right? But I know that definitely now so well. Um, and with the unique and beautiful demographic and cultural character, we have the highest, the nation highest percentage of Hispanic and Latino Americans, and the second highest percentage of Native American um, after Alaska. I think we need to repeat that fact over and over again, at least for myself and a lot of us here. Um, I think it's so important for us to support uh, the uh, CCP um, uh, People's Map. Congressional District 2 should be the majority minority, uh, Hispanic and community of color, Black, Indigenous, uh, Asian, Latino, Hispanic. Again, thank you for your support. We have Saira Loya. Um, is it okay if I say it in Spanish so the public is able to hear and then in English? Of course. Okay. Buenas tardes, señor presidente y miembros del consejo. Estoy aquí para apoyar el mapa de las personas y el mapa E que acoja en el mapa. So good afternoon, Mr. President. The members of the committee are here to support the map and people who are part of that. Also, map E. I think as a Latina, my family who are the Mexican heritage, we've been here for 15 years. I was born here, but raised in Mexico. And I think if we divide that, um, you're taking away the voice of that uh, people. So I think it's very important that we stay united as not only community, but as a map as well. Um, the reason I'm saying it in Spanish is that they're able to hear me as well in their native language. So I think it's important to, for them to be acknowledged as well in both languages, so they're able to understand. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Robert Aragon. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, members, my name is Robert Adagon. I am the first vice chair of the Republican Party. Not here today to talk about one preference that the party has officially made, but first of all, express our gratitude for the commitment that this committee has made in having fair and equitable districts, not only as it relates to congressional districts, but also as we move forward with our other districts as well, both House, Senate, and the Education Committee that we need to district. We are simply asking at this point in time that you consider all, all possibilities in terms of how we balance our districts, both congressional and otherwise. We think that it's important that we have both urban as well as rural areas taken into consideration as we move forward with our congressional maps. We're hopeful 
that we have what one might consider a urban type of district that might include the Rio Rancho Bernalillo area. Uh, we are hopeful as well that we do not split up Bernalillo County in any way because of the common economic interests that we have in Bernalillo County that might be shared with Sandoval County. But I want to make sure that the committee understands that we are not at this point in time endorsing one map over another, but rather want to express our interest as a party that whatever you do, the recommendations that they're fair and equitable, that they respect the continuity of communities, which we think are important. We view that Bernalillo County is one community and that it should not be split up at least at this juncture. I know your maps will be evolving as more information comes forward, but we're looking forward to providing more information to you as the process continues to wind down. So as a party, we are encouraging this committee to move forward with its work, balance all the interests that may exist, making sure that the communities of interest continue to be in place and that every entity, every individual, that their interests are respected when we draw these maps and finally hopefully approve these maps. So again, as the first vice chair of the Republican Party, uh, we're supportive of what you're doing. We just ask for equity, we ask for fairness, and we ask that you weigh all the considerations that are outlined in Reynolds versus Sims. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask a question, please, of Mr. Aragon? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. Yeah, hi. I, Senator? I, that's very nice of you, but Lisa's fine. Thank you. I want to, uh, so I, I've asked this question several times of people. So if if you have maps that you plan to bring forward, can you tell us when you plan to have those so that we can analyze them? Yes, indeed. Let me suggest to the committee that the executive committee of the Republican Party has been analyzing all the maps and we hope to have our official position on the various maps and what our perspectives are at uh, the next round of meetings so that you all can be informed of at least the position that the party has taken. Uh, but generally, um, Mr. Chair and, and Senator, uh, the position of the party right now is that we're just asking for the basic principles, again, outlined in Reynolds versus Sims be adhered to. We're convinced that if that is taken into account, that the areas of interest will continue to be represented, the continuity of communities will be represented, and there will be a balance that will be struck um, with all the congressional districts and Senate districts as well as the House districts. So yes, you will be receiving an official position. Uh, we were somewhat uh, reserved in that. We did want to muddle the waters in terms of having a Republican map, but we will certainly give our opinions on all the maps. We are working on that as we speak. Okay, I'm sure I being a lawyer. Right, and, 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 and that's okay, I, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as Senator. <laughs> I, I did not hear your answer. All right, so um, uh, I, I did not hear you answer the question because this is the old, this is the second round of meetings that we have. Right. And so I under, not looking for a Republican position, I suppose. It's just if you all have commentary that you want us to consider, um, we asked the same question when we were at Crown Point when. You think you might tell us that information? Do you I will have that time people? Yes, I do. I know that there is going to be a meeting in the Albuquerque area. I believe it's October the 8th. Um, that is the date that we anticipate to have at least our official positions on the various maps. Um, I think Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Pierce will be the person presenting them. And if that's not the case, it will be me as the first vice chair of the party. I hope that's a definitive uh, date. That would be the anticipated date that we'll be able to respond to those questions. And, and our position. Thank you. Something to look forward to. Appreciate uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Justice, mm -hmm. any other questions? Yeah, I do have a question. Are you just going to be responding to the concepts that the CRC is moving forward? We believe that that's probably the more appropriate thing for us to do. Uh, again, the whole idea of this commission is to try to make this process as nonpartisan as possible and as equitable as possible. The Republican Party of New Mexico has embraced that concept of trying to take this away from a purely political process, which I know is very difficult. 
and we understand that, but the party's position is we embrace what you all are doing as a committee. We think it's timely, we think it's time that we have citizens have their input as, as opposed to this being purely, purely a political process. We understand the body politic will play its role. It will, we understand that. We're good with that. And our position has been, let this process play out a little bit and give our commentary as to the general direction of the various congressional districts as well as legislative districts as well. Again, all we're asking for is equity. We embrace the principles outlined again in Reynolds and Sims. We think that's appropriate. And the 1929 uh, Reapportionment Act that was passed almost 100 years ago, we like those concepts and we embrace those moving forward, Mr. Justice. Do you think uh, your party would like to comment on people's map, the congressional district map that has been widely supported for today? It will be our position that uh, we will be prepared to respond and give our positions on all the various proposals on the October 8th meeting. I, I believe that's going to be here in Albuquerque as well. No, Farmington. Well, whenever October 8th is, that's when we're, that's our good update, right. Mr. Chief Justice. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Aragon. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Felipe Rodriguez. Junior or senior? Junior. <laughs> Great interpreting skill. <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the committee. I will be brief today. Uh, I would like to state my support for CCP's The People's Map. Uh, as an organizer with immigrant communities, I understand the importance of equitable representation, and we believe this map achieves that while keeping balanced the population of the three districts. Thank you. And then next we have Josue de Luna. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Josue de Luna Navarro. I'm from the Center for Civic Policy and I'm also a co-founder of the New Mexico Dream Team. And I just wanted to express my support to the People's Map. Thank you. And then next we have Matilde Merendo. Buenas tardes, señor presidente y miembros del consejo. Yo soy una organizadora de OLE y estoy aquí en nombre de muchas de las personas de nuestros miembros que me han solicitado pedir el apoyo, el mapa de las personas y el mapa de él. Lo acojan como mapa. Creo que tiene que ser escuchada nuestra voz. Tengo más de 30 años viviendo aquí en Albuquerque y puedo ver cómo ha crecido en el suroeste, el southwest. Contamos con el 55% de los votantes. Espero que puedan tomar esto en cuenta y se los voy a agradecer. Queremos ser escuchados, que llegue nuestra voz a todas las partes que tiene que ser. Debemos tomar en cuenta a toda nuestra comunidad. No queremos que se haga una división. Dividiría costumbres, razas y comunidad y no nos vamos a sentir a gusto así. Muchísimas gracias. Hi, my name is Matilde Miranda. I'm an organizer with the organization OLE. I am here in representation of many members who are supporting the People's Map. Uh, we want to make our voice heard. I have been living here in Albuquerque for more than 30 years, and I have seen the growth in the Southwest area. We Hispanics have 55% of the vote, so we, we want you to count us in. We want to be heard. We want uh, we want you to take uh, the entire community into account. We want there to be no divisions based on our, um, our race, culture, and community. Thank you. Is Mirna Oscano here now? Mirna? No? Okay. Is there anybody else who wanted to speak about the congressional maps? Please introduce yourself. And uh, yes, so we see who you're with. Beautiful to request shirt. 
Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Felipe Vasquez with El Centro de Igualdad de Derechos. I'm the communications organizer. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Felipe Vasquez with El Centro de Igualdad de Derechos. I'm the communications organizer for it. Um, I'm here in the paper with the concept of a uh, house map E and people map of congressional map. The Central and immigrant communities have been organizing and engaging in New Mexico for decades so that all our communities can thrive. This includes uh, ensuring that our communities participate in the 2020 census. We created many videos and testimonials uh, of our community leaders uh, living in the South Valley who are facing lack of resources and opportunities. In these videos, they recorded the lack of sidewalks, lighting, parks, hospital and resources the communities are going through. We need to stop erasing our minorities communities and give us an equal opportunity to thrive. If <clears throat> it is time to strengthen minority majority districts across the state and have, and have for the first time a majority minority congressional district with over 55% minority Hispanic and voting age. Thank you very much. Next, we have a general comment from Patty Williams. Good afternoon, committee staff and preachers and polling. I'm, I'm Patty Williams. I represent the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission in this process. And I'm not speaking on a particular map today, but about a systemic problem that's hampering the Navajo Nation and probably others ability to um, present maps to the CRC and um, have their maps considered for public comment as concept maps. And that problem is the adjusted precinct boundaries um, are not available in Districtor for San Juan County and their commission has acted on their um, precinct changes. And I don't know, and I think that research and polling probably does, on whether Bernalillo County and Cibola County have acted on their precinct splits as well, but that information is also not available on Districtor. Um, Navajo Nation uses Maptitude, which is the gold standard in um, redistricting and mapping software, and it's not able to be moved. The Maptitude maps are not able to be moved into Districtor at this point with the accurate and correct precinct information that Navajo Nation is using on their maps. And so those maps aren't being published and we wanted to let you know that's why you haven't seen um, our maps published yet. And we've been trying to work with research and polling, they have the same problem. Um, and we don't know how to solve that problem. <laughs> so just wanted to make you aware. Thank you. I think Ms. Williams, as soon as uh, all the precincts are settled, we can probably get that information over the district here and we'll be able to import or upload whatever the proper terminology is, a Maptitude maps onto district here. Meantime, we have published uh, the Navajo maps. If you're asking us to move them over into the concepts area, are you talking about just the, the two of the three or did you want all three maps? Um, I don't have that information for you today, Justice Chavez and committee, but I will let you know. We are happy to have you consider our 6% standard deviation map, our 7% standard deviation map, and our 65% non-Hispanic Native American bat map um, as concept maps, because they all present very different pictures of the Northwest Quadrant. Okay. So thank you. Can I ask you a question, Ms. Williams? Yes. In the chair? So, uh, Ms. Williams, do you guys have the maps that we saw in Crown Point? Do you have them with all the districts in them? Just so we understand how the external boundaries of those maps affect the remainder. Um, Commissioner Curtis, new, the Navajo Nation has never redistricted for the entire state. They don't think it's in their purview or their mission. They have just district, uh, redistricted and created maps for the Northwest Quadrant. That's what they've done traditionally through the last several mapping processes that they've presented maps or maps have been able to be presented in. And they think that it is not their business to redistrict 
outside of those areas where there would be Native American minority majority districts. So um, maybe the question is for both you and Mr. Sandra, and that is the external boundary that is presented on the maps that we were given in Crown Point. Do we know those with sufficient um, particularity that we can impose them on maps that we have so we know how, how things are being impacted? Yes. Excellent, can we do that? <laughs> well, we, we, even in those maps, <laughs> even in those maps provided by uh, Patty and Mr. Gorman, they did show their boundaries of the east district and the outer boundaries. So we do have that. And we also have it in magnitude. Okay, I maybe I'm not saying my question specifically enough. My my question is I want to be able to see how that how that impacts the other maps that have already been created. Is that is that something that you can do for us? We have been experimenting with the Navajo regional plans and attempting to insert them into our concepts to see how well or poorly that works. So we are experimenting with that. Okay, so apparently I am the uh, time person on the committee. Do you know when we might have that information so we can look at it? Well, both the Navajo maps and the Pueblo maps have been changing a little over time and uh, but we have been experimenting with that. Um, I think that's probably the best answer we can give right now. A lot of it depends on which deviation map we work off of, uh, but uh, we, we are in the process of doing that. We anticipate a lot of that will be done also or shown to you, you know, after all these hearings, you know, in the 10 days after the hearings for you to make a lot of decisions. Uh, but uh, we are working on that now, assessing how hard or easy it would be to insert, let's say, regional plans when somebody uses a deviation as low as minus seven or minus six, and how that impacts the uh, concept. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Williams? Good to see you, Betty. Thank you. Next, we have Sachi Watasi. Hello, Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Sachi Watase, and I'm the Executive Director of the New Mexico Asian Family Center. I'm in strong support of um, the congressional map provided, um, proposed by the People's Map Campaign and CCP. Um, this map protects minority voting rights, cross-racial cross solidarity and movement building, and protects the agency and power that each and every New Mexican deserves to have when making decisions on behalf of their own families, children, and futures. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Ellen Lucas, H E L E N. Uh, hi, my name is Helen Lopez. I'm a lifetime uh, resident of the South Valley. Um, my parents were here. Uh, my father is, in fact, has a step out by the statues up there. He was a POW in World War II. Uh, my concern is gerrymandering. I'm a lifelong Democrat and see what's going on nationwide. I just see my power as a Democrat trying to be diluted. And I'm concerned based on what's going on nationwide. And how does someone in like Yvette Harrell, how is she gonna represent me? You know, I didn't vote for her. Um, we are different. I have nothing against small town people. They have their culture, but by and large, most of them run Republican and that's fine. But I feel, and I, maybe I'm wrong in some respects that my power as a Democrat is gonna be diluted and other Democrats, and I'm more 
urban. Um, I'm not urban, but we're part, we've been part of Albuquerque for a long time. In fact, there's always been talk about Bernalillo County, city of Albuquerque, merging into one governmental entity. My main concern, I'm not against having paved roads or hospitals, but we need to make sure before we commit to one map, how it affects us politically. Because I think the Democrats are a lot more progressive than the Republicans in the Southern districts who seem to be, uh, you know, win down there. That's my concern. Thank you. Uh, hi, committee members. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for letting me here this afternoon. My name is Xin Wei. Um, I moved to Albuquerque in 2015 and have been lived in this lovely city for six years. I'm here to support the map um, E, suggested by Center for uh, of City Policy. And I also would like to um, support the idea to keep District 19 as a whole. Um, I didn't know too much about remapping until recently I heard uh, a rumor about District 19 might be sliced into two uh, if we don't do anything. So I started learning how redistricting work and I realized this is a good chance for us to advocate a map might have some positive impact to all of us in the next 10 years. Um, from 2015 to 2017, I have been lived in District 19 for school because um, it is closer to public transportation and closer to UNM. And also the rental property there were very affordable. Um, the district also has a very rich history about immigrants, refugees, and their families. There are many Asian-owned business, restaurant, and religious locations in, in their area. So that for many people I knew, in the, um, in the National District is a very symbolic area because uh, people share many memories and the connection there. Although pandemic changed many things, um, it didn't change people's basic needs. Me and my many friends of mine still visit that area very often for grocery shopping and dining. I hope International District can be one piece in this way. I hope our councilmen and councilwomen um, in the future can make better policy and make it a better place. Um, this is not, uh, there is a not many places like International District in New Mexico. Um, by keeping International District as a whole with its historical boundary and it can help our community preserve our history um, and the linkage to Albuquerque and keep us united. Thank you. Is there anybody on Zoom? No, because it's happening right now. Okay, uh, member Kanjelosi. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody who's come. You guys have a very well organized group of people that are speaking with one voice, and that's very moving and very telling uh, to your commitment to your community. And I, I absolutely love the solidarity and community here. And that's what makes New Mexico, that's what makes Albuquerque. And so I'm so grateful that I was born and raised here. And so, I've lived in different parts of the city, up in the Northeast Heights and the West Side. I live in the Valley now. 
and uh, have friends that have lived in every area of this uh, city and absolutely love every aspect of it. One of my dearest friends grew up in the South Valley. And so hearing from so many people in the South Valley about representation, about having a voice in your voting and having your community, uh, this be a community of interest and thinking that CD2 going down into the Southern District would be more apropos and better for your community. I have to say I'm a bit perplexed by that concept and just want some clarity. So before I get into this next area where I'm asking a question, I'm going to ask Mr. Sandroff, right now in CD1, 2, and 3, what are the uh, demographics with regards to Hispanics in CD1, CD2, and CD3? Voting age population. Yeah, voting age population data. Yeah. Michael, okay. So we're going to look at those numbers because my question is this, in the last four representatives, and we'll go through them here in a second when we see these numbers, but we had, well, five actually. We had Heather Wilson for many years, um, who then was preceded by, or succeeded by, um, Martin Heinrich, who's our U.S. Senator here in New Mexico, who then uh, was succeeded by our governor, Governor Lujan Grisham, who then left and we had our Secretary of the Interior now, Deb Holland, who was our Congresswoman here in CD1. And then once Deb Holland went to become Interior Secretary, we have Melanie Stansberry. So that is the last five representatives that we've had here in Albuquerque representing CD1. So my question to you is, out of the five people that we've had in the last, have they not represented the South Valley well or to the place that you would want to move from Congressional District 1, which is in the Albuquerque area, Bernalillo County, Albuquerque area, to the Southern District, it goes down to Hobbs, Artesia, Carlsbad, uh, Silver City, Tier C, Las Cruces. I, I'm just trying to, because I really want to hear you, because you guys have come here, we spent two hours listening to a very, very telling, and all of you guys have the same message that you feel like would be better represented if it's shifted that the South Valley is a part of CD2. I want to better understand the representation that you're missing right now in the last several, Senator Heinrich, Governor Leon Grisham, Interior Secretary of Holland, and Melanie Stansbury, Representative Melanie Stansbury, and what you think being part of CD2, Representative uh, Event Herald is gonna help you guys having a voice because we want to make sure it's our job that everybody has a voice in their voting and in their representation. But real quickly, those numbers, I'm going to look at the map. Okay, thank you. The numbers for I'll just three percent adult Hispanic, just right off the top for District 1, 45.1, for District 2, 50.8, District 3, 37.1 percent. Okay, so we're, we're talking about a five percent difference. CD1 right now compared to CD2 with regards to um, voting age population Hispanic. So very close, very similar. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm clear that I'm understanding how you're going to be better represented if we do adopt a concept map that has you now being a part combining with the Southern District. If anybody from maybe Center for Civic Policy can explain to, to me and to the committee that concept. I would really appreciate it. Would you like them to? If, if there's someone that can represent the map. <laughs> now that, that's just my question is, I just want to make sure that we're hearing from you how you'd be better represented if that shift is made. Pull it up. Thanks. Uh, so again, Andrea Serrano, and um, I think 
you know, as we're talking about this, and I, I know you mentioned the current um, representative for CD2, I think what all of us can acknowledge is that redistricting doesn't guarantee that that same person will stay in the seat. So, you know, um, I, I think that there's lots of folks who would agree right now that in Congressional District 2, they do not feel represented by their current representative. The, the reality is in the map, the people's map, when you look at the way that it's redistricted, what we're talking about is increasing the population of voters of color in every single district above 50%. This New Mexico is a people of color majority state where 63% of the population, not just Latinos, but 63 public of, of um, Latino, Asian, Native, Black, um, and other folks who are, who are identified as, as people of color. And yet we're 38% of the voter turnout. In 2020, we were 38% of the statewide voter turnout. In 2017, in Albuquerque, people of color were 25% of the municipal turnout. And in the South Valley, where I live, we can't even vote in municipal elections. So the work that I do is all for creating policy and getting folks into office who, you know, who will get Albuquerque on a really good track. And I don't even get to vote in those elections. So I don't, I don't get that kind of say. This isn't a slide against our current representation in CD1 or even the previous with um, Secretary Deb Holland and currently with Representative Dansbury. But what we are talking about is the fact that Albuquerque is a really big city. And, and I know it still feels kind of like a small town because we're in New Mexico and we don't have this huge population like you. You know, you go to New York and you're like, oh yeah, no, Albuquerque is not a big city, but for where we're at, it is. It is a big city. And so when we're talking about the needs of the South Valley, what we're talking about is currently, the needs are very different from the needs of the Northeast Heights, from the needs of the Far North Valley, from the needs of the Southeast Heights. And so being able to split up that representation so that there can be a greater voice um, I was just sharing a picture with my friends, um, this Smith that's right here in the South Valley, I have a photo of, you know, someone rode their horse and tied them up to the bike rack. You're not gonna see that at Smith on, on Wyoming and Academy. Just like see you're not, that, right? Just even Corrales. You might, but the needs of Corrales economically and racially are so vastly different from the needs of the South Valley. And so we might ride horses, but we might be riding, you know, we might be riding horses, but we also have very, very different needs and I don't I don't ride a horse just so we're all clear. I don't want to be representing like let's not put that in the record. I, I don't ride horses, but what I will say is this. I think as we're talking about this map and I think what we're talking about about this entire um, citizens redistricting committee and what folks have been really showing up today to talk about is this issue of equity and fairness. And the gentleman earlier talked about you know wanting to ensure that there's equity and fairness. 38% of a voter turnout of the largest population in this state is not air equity and fairness. And so that's, that really is what we're talking about when we're talking about redistricting the South Valley. And you know, ultimately we know the state legislature makes this decision, but this body has been trusted with giving an opinion. And that's why the people's map, we're urging and showing up and making public comment for the CRC to adopt this as a map for serious consideration because the folks in this room are very serious about the future of this state. And that's why it's a serious map that should be considered for, um, by the CRC. And so I appreciate your question. And uh, if you, you know, if you want to like look at horses at some point, I'm oh, sure like in South Valley somewhere yes. Like I live literally like the Bosque and then my house is right there. And so, and I've lived in the South Valley for seven years now. My boyfriend has lived in the South Valley his entire life. He went to Rio Grande High School and he can tell you right now, the needs of Rio Grande High School are vastly different from the needs of El Dorado, vastly different from the needs of Cibola, from Valley, which is where I went to school. I'm from this city, I am with this city, I am this city. And so I believe that having different congressional uh, representation can only mean good things for this city as a whole. So that, I, I appreciate you sharing that because that's the first time we've heard that, that having two representatives in a closer area is something that you're looking for, which totally makes sense and I understand that. But I have a question for you with voter turnout. You're saying that voter turnout was 38% and redistricting or having um, 
so two things. One, we know that CD2 has a higher uh, Hispanic voter age population than CD1 currently. Mm -hmm. We're talking about moving out a portion of the Hispanic population in the South Valley into CD2, which already is the largest uh, when it comes. Does your map have, because you were saying you want to get all three districts up above 50%, isn't that what you said? Each map is at 55% so for voters of color. Just the CD2 or each of the congressional districts? Each of the districts. Okay. 55 okay. or 50? 50. 55. For all three or just 55 for CD2? 55 of the voters. 55% of the voters. Well, population, voting age population. Sure. So it's increasing CD2's percentage of yes. And it's about connection and community of interest. There's a lot of families in the South Valley that continue having uh, <laughs> a families in the South Valley that have families in the Southern, that it just doesn't align the representation that we have in Washington or how they are articulating the needs of the whole New Mexico. If we're able to value to have a saying of that, DC policy will change. And that's the reason why we want to be part of CD. Okay. okay. And what's your name, ma'am? Who's talking that was about it? Thank you so much for your explanation. I really do appreciate it. And I do really appreciate everybody who's come out here today and put so much time and effort into this. And so it's just questions that we're trying to figure out where people are coming from. It, every time we can ask these questions, it helps us a lot in putting together in our own heads these concepts. Thank you so much for your time and yeah. for the effort today. And, and Member Kanye Losi, I know your question, but you initially directed it for the Center for Civic Policy. And so Andre um, Serrano is with Ole. So why don't we have Oriana um, Sandoval, who is with um, Center for Civic Policy, come on up. Hi, I'm Oriana Sandoval. I'm the CEO of the Center for Civic Policy. I uh, appreciate your questions and really uh, taking testimony today seriously and, you know, probing and asking questions about our map and why we think this is the future of New Mexico. And so, like you heard today, testimony from our community leaders that live in Bernalillo, that live across the state, this has been, these are leaders that have been working for generations with our communities. We have been taking the redistricting process seriously and rethinking what the new New Mexico should look like so that we all are represented fairly. And so, um, you know, the map that people came out to testify in support of, that's the, that's the result of a lot of deliberation, compromise amongst our communities, uh, and coming together in solidarity around like what is New Mexico that is an amazing state, a majority people of color state, deep ties to indigenous, black, uh, Hispano, Asian American communities. How do we, that, that's a beautiful strength that we have. So that is the map that you are seeing today. Um, and again, to highlight that we wanted to make sure that New Mexico has the Hispanic majority district. And so carving out the South Valley, that's a community of interest that as you heard today, a lot of our community members identify with the needs of Southern New Mexico, with the character of Southern New Mexico, and importantly, making sure that our, our majority, New Mexico is the state, the state in the country that has the highest Latino population, Hispanic population. So in order for, we believe that we should have the right to elect someone of our choice, someone from our community that represents our interests. And quite frankly, what we've heard today from community members in South Valley is that they stand in solidarity with people in CD2 who have not had access to fair representation. Um, so that is what we're hearing today, solidarity with our communities across the state, including Albuquerque and including the South Valley to re-envision the New Mexico where we all have a fair shot at fair representation. Great, thank so. you. I just wanted to uh, make three comments and then I ask a question uh, for you, Mr. Chair. So first, um, when, uh, so my family and I, we moved to uh, New Mexico in 2018. 
between 2016 and 2018, I was traveling back and forth between California and New Mexico. And my younger son would join me on many of those trips. On one of those trips, he and I were discussing our move to Albuquerque and the attendant that was going to rent us our car, she heard our conversation and she said, where are you thinking of living? And when I said, well, where do you think we should live? She pulled out a map and the first thing she did was she put a big X to the South Valley and said, anywhere but here. Uh, I, I teach in the South Valley now. Part of my attraction to it was because any, you know, I, I wanted to find out what was behind that X that she wrote. And part of what I've heard today is what I've learned from our Native American brothers, which is the importance of self-determination. So, so that, that to me is a, a key value. And I guess the, the and, and then just really quickly, last year during Zoom, one of my students, uh, I was doing an advisory session and I heard all this noise and I said, Martin, what is that noise? He said, Mr. Don't you know what roosters sound like? And he was in the South Valley. Um, and I said, okay, well now, now I do, Martin. Uh, so my question is, if we approve a concept map, all that's doing is allowing for further discussion. Is that, is that correct? If you approve a concept map, it doesn't mean that we agree with the map. It means that we are putting that front and center for the public to be able to comment on. If we do not move them front and center, then they remain in the public gallery with uh, close to 200 maps and comments. Uh, so, so that's the, the nature of moving it, moving a concept forward. Did, did that answer your question? Yes. Hi, Chair. Um, very first thing, I want to make sure that everyone in this group, and especially my brothers, and I mean my brothers because I don't have any sisters, on this committee, recognize that 90% of the people that stood up here and talked about this map were women, and many young women, right, talking for their community. To, uh, I want to make, I know uh, committee member Cantalosi didn't ask the question of the committee, but I know a difference in economic strength of the South Valley, all right, and that is more closely aligned, sometimes I wonder, to Southern New Mexico, frankly, than as, as has been uh, stated before, than to Tanawan, all right? I mean, there are differences in the rural nature. And what I've heard from you, and also from any member Sanchez, is the reality of those differences. So I am going to move, uh, I'm going to make a motion that we move the people's map into the concept maps so it can be considered and commented on by the public going forward. Do I have a second? I, I know it's been seconded, but can I comment on that? Oh, yeah. It's been moved and seconded that uh, we allow the people's Congressional district map to be moved into the CRC concept maps. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess first, I before Mr. Uh, Joaquin Sanchez seconded, I, I was about to, uh, because I think just the support that we have seen today absolutely um, deserves that it be put for public comment and uh, that process play forward. Early on in this process, I, I know I spoke with some of you out there about this. Um, and I, I guess I do understand why the South Valley feels closely connected with um, Southern New Mexico. Um, and I think I even shared, you know, being from Southern New Mexico, being from going to school in Anthony, um, I still often, you know, get away for an afternoon and get my menudo fix in the South Valley. It's the only place I, I can do that. Um, I get it. Two, uh, but I have two concerns, and I think it's fair to state them now. So, because I know you will hear them. If this goes to public comment, it's going to come out. So, um, I'm putting it out there because I'm thinking about it, and I know others are as well. The first concern, and it's already come out in Farmington, it came out in Doniana County, and that is urban versus rural. The people's map, if you will, splits Albuquerque three ways, essentially, or excuse me, Albuquerque and Rio Rancho splits it three ways. Um, 
I think it's legitimate to believe that the urban area needs its own representation and that the rural areas need their representation. Perhaps the question is, where does the South Valley fall? Is it urban or rural? And I think that's a worthy discussion, but the current map, as I think we just have a motion and a second, um, splits the urban area, I, what I see as the urban area, three ways. And I think that's a problem. Um, certainly something to think about. The other problem I see with this particular map, and I, I don't remember the number, I think it's uh, concept D. I'm looking at Brian, which is the concept that no, but the concept that was submitted that actually does have the South Valley with the District 2. Is that D? Okay, unlike D, D puts the South Valley with the South. And I'm not saying this is my map either. I'm, I'm just pointing this out. But unlike the people's map, the only area that is split, arguably in three, is the Albuquerque general area. The people's map, I I see it as splitting another community of interest, and that's the southeast portion of the state. It's split in three. Um, so you have Albuquerque split in three, and the southeast portion split in three. And I think that's that's a concern. And I again, I absolutely want this to go to public comment because it should. And you absolutely, I think, have more than earned that. Um, and I, I very much appreciate the comments today. But I think those are issues and um, would love to hear more comments about them as we move forward. So with that, thank you. We have one more person. I know you have a vote, but we have one more Any person. Any other discussion speak. on the motion? Is there somebody who can speak to the drawing of the map that's in the audience? Ariana, do you want to talk about the drawing? Or Ms. Kuna. Hello, Ellie, my only question is uh, the way they're numbered. Did you intend for the green to be the CD1? The uh, blue CD2? Yes. So, so if we change blue? those. The blue, it will be a representative Esther right now. That will be CD3. The green will be a representative Melanie right now. That will be CD2. And I mean, CD1. And the yellow one will be CD1. CD2. CD2. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can like, change it. <laughs> you have like a 10. Computer right here. I think it, as the public looks at it, they could be confused. And so yes. I just want so uh, the, the first to one, yes. the first one. The blue one is three, the green one is one, the yellow one is two. Okay. Okay. And giving you the reason why we also end up with a map like this is because we heard really closely or members in Roswell and Hobbs, and they wanna have different representation. So there was a really intentional, really intentional conversation across the whole state where as a good familia, sometimes you need to give and give. So that's the reason that you're gonna have other CRC meetings, huh? <laughs> Any further discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstain passes unanimously. Shana, we have one more person who wants to speak about the congressional maps and a slew of people who want to speak about the house map. Well, we've heard about the house from everybody. This is true. <laughs> There's more. Um, but the person who wanted to speak specifically about the congressional maps is Ms. Yunya.
Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. So I want to support both uh, the CCP people's map and also the health concept E. Um, so I'm originally from China, but I've lived in the U.S. for uh, 12 years. And I came to Albuquerque four years ago and made a home here. Uh, as a member of the Asian and uh, Pacific Islander community, I'm here uh, to support the CCP uh, people's map and also the house uh, map E. Um, I support this map because this map brings together communities and interests that have unique characters and cultures and give them an opportunity to elect a candidate of their own choice. And this map also provides a wonderful opportunity for racial solidarity and diversity. Thank you very much for your consideration. Is that it for congressional discussion? Yes. Okay, let's take a little break. 10 minute break. Thank you. So we're rejoining at 520. So please be back then. And then one of the things I've been asked about is just the ability to hear. And so if folks need to have conversation, cool, cool, beautiful. But if you could do that in the lobby area so folks can hear one another and the members, that would be awesome. Thank you.
All right, let's call the meeting to order. Okay, uh, if you don't mind, committee, I think what we'll do instead of Senate match, is Michael back? My Michael's out for a while. Yeah, I, I think I, <clears throat> I think I want to go to house maps next because people, a lot of people want to talk about that, and I think we can get it taken care of. Michael, we're going to go ahead and move to the house map. So if you'll just give us a uh, an overview, then we'll go to public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give some brief descriptions of the house districts for each of the four uh, house concepts. And then, uh, and then I guess we'll be uh, open for questions and comments. So first of all, just to set the stage um, with respect to Albuquerque, uh, Rio Rancho, and West Side, Heights of Albuquerque. One thing to remember when looking at the maps is that over the past 10 years, the uh, city of Rio Rancho, and with respect to the, the four districts that they currently have, that they ended up with enough population within Rio Rancho um, for an extra I guess, half a seat. So you add up all the positive deviations, that, that some of those positive deviations are about 50%. And that would indicate to us that uh, where they currently have three and a half districts, there's enough population for four. So that's just one thing to keep in mind when looking at the districts. And as a whole, the uh, Rio Rancho plus the West Side of Albuquerque plus the river has a population for just over 12 full districts. So if you go into concept A, one of the uh, objectives of concept A was to take a seat in North Central New Mexico, either 40 or 70, and move it into the West Side or Rio Rancho just to see what happens. And so we chose to put it into Rio Rancho in the middle of town, you can see it's, uh, it's gray. And what that did was in the, in the current plan, their current house districts, when you throw on the black lines, this, uh, this little 
district right here, signified by the black lines, is House 23. When you add in uh, House 70 into Rio Rancho, that basically forces House 23 to scoot south of the county line. And so you see it, you do end up with four districts within Rio Rancho, 60, 70, 44, 57, and then one house district 63 that used to be half uh, Corrales, half West Side, is now entirely the West Side. And as Brian mentioned before, and we saw it with respect to the correctional districts, the numbering is, is semantics. You could say, geez, uh, 23 is currently part of uh, Corrales, West Side. You could certainly say that switch the district numbers between 23 and 70 if you wanted. That's, that's my potential <laughs> So 23 gets pushed south. Uh, the other districts on the west side are fairly compact. Um, in the current districts, this is an example um, in terms of um, compactness. 68 is a nice compact district. It was some wiggles in the current district uh, lines. So one of the other objectives was to try to straighten out some of the district lines within the house plan. So we tried to do that throughout the city in the state if possible. Uh, so in the one other thing to mention within uh, the northwestern part of the, of the city is today uh, Paradise Hills is split between two districts. In this particular plan, Paradise Hills is, is united within District 68, whereas on the other, on the flip side, uh, Batana Ranch is entirely within one district uh, today, and but in this plan, it's split between two districts. That's one, one difference between current and this particular plan. As we get on the west side, pretty straightforward districts. Another major change is House 29 was uh, a district that went from Mirror Haven uh, near the new football stadium on the west side, high school football stadium and, and ball fields. And it went all the way up to uh, you know, Ventana Ranch. And because it grew so much, it had to shrink a lot. It ended up losing you know, its, entire, its entire southern half of its population. So instead of Mirror Haven, Mirror Haven being with House 29, it's now with House 16. And then House 16 used to go from Central all the way up to Taylor Ranch, and you now it stays north of I-40. Uh, the rest of the South Valley uh, and the areas south of Central, fairly close to what they are today, so uh, pretty status quo in that respect. And then within the heights of Albuquerque, again, all the districts are pretty straight, pretty uh, close to what you have today. And if you compare the color against the current black lines, um, You'll notice that we did straighten out a, lot, a bunch of the boundaries so that there aren't as many uh, little fingers sticking up and that kind of thing. So that was, that was one of the objectives. The other thing we heard was that the international district should be its own district. Currently, it's split between two. And in this particular plan, the international district is entirely within uh, House 19. Uh, the other comment we heard was the Rio Grande should be a hard boundary between districts, basically from the county line uh, down to I 40 in this particular particular plan, the, uh, the river is used as a boundary between districts all the way down to about Rio Bravo. So districts stay on one side of the river all the way down to Rio Bravo, Rio Bravo, with District 10 being the only one that uh, crosses the river. So I mentioned four, uh, we had four Rancho, Rio Rancho does have four districts, the, whole, the west side does have eight entire districts, uh, with plus House 10, which does cross the district, so that's 12 full districts within that Rio Rancho and the west side. Uh, Valencia County, just as a quick note, uh, the district seven and eight are almost identical to what they are today. If we compare the color uh, districts in the plain with the black lines representing the current house districts. And then, so I'll go ahead and move to house concept B. This is a slightly different take. Um, it was drawn without consideration of the current district boundary. So in essence, we're trying to draw a, a plan from scratch just to see what would happen. So we didn't look at the current district lines, uh, really didn't look at where the current legislators live either. And um, so within this plan, Rio Rancho still has the four districts, just a different alignment within Rio Rancho to give you an idea of what those districts can look like. When compared to the previous plan, uh, we saw that uh, Ventana Ranch was split between two, district, two districts, Paradise Hills was in one. When we thought, well, what can we uh, do to put Ventana Ranch in a single district? In that case, uh, it's uh, 29 in this 
uh, concept B. On the, on the other hand, uh, Paradise Hills is split between 23 and 29. So we kind of flip flop between which one was split and which one was not. And so the districts are still pretty compact uh, on the west side, House 14 does, is the only one that crosses I-40. So it has a couple of precincts north of I-40 between Coors and the Rio Grande. And uh, you also notice that District 10, uh, when compared to the previous plan, District 10 was the one that crossed the river. In this case, District 10 moved all the way to the west side of the river uh, instead of the current being split, uh, uh, being split by the river in uh, the current districts in the previous plan. Within the heights of Albuquerque, I-25 is using a, a nice solid boundary between districts. Uh, in the current, within the current uh, districts in black, you'll notice that House 15 is going to move far north these tights. Uh, House 17 crossed the freeway and so on. So we straightened out that boundary between districts. And then within Southeast Albuquerque in the gateway area, we, we tried to use I-40 as a solid line between districts as well. So uh, fewer districts do cross the river. We tried to use uh, geographic boundaries, major roads, major features to, uh, to use boundary lines because that's a common thing that's sometimes used. Again, international district is within a single district. Uh, Fluency County uh, is similar again. It has enough population for two full districts. So that means that you can put two full districts within Valencia County, but there's population left over for other districts to come in. And so uh, you still have District 7 and 8 Valencia County and highest House 40 um, does come into Valencia County in the southern part, southern part of Berlin. So that's one thing to remember with Valencia County. It has enough population for two plus, plus a little bit more for other districts to come in. So in plan C, our concept C, the objective here was to take, instead of moving a north central district of New Mexico onto the west side of Rio Rancho, we took a district within the heights of Albuquerque. And so what happens if you take a heights district and then put it into, uh, say, the west side of Rio Rancho? That happened to be House 24. And House 24 was centered roughly you know, Eubank and Lomas-ish area. And so all the other districts around House 24 came in and took pieces of 24, so eventually 24 was gone, and it was relocated up into uh, Rio Rancho. So Rio Rancho, once again, does have four districts, plus a little bit of the fifth. And this is another case where if you wanted, you could put, you could switch the district numbers between 23 and 24. Uh, if you wanted the new district by the number to be on the west side, you can do that at 23, since it's already in Corrales, perhaps it could stay in the Rio Rancho Corrales area. The rest of the boundaries are fairly similar. Um, District 13 stays the same. District 26 goes a little bit further north of the freeway by 40. District 10 stays uh, as a district that is on both sides of the river. And again, the international district is within House District 19. One quick note, and I want to go back to concept B just because uh, I forgot to mention it earlier, but uh, the it does have a House 22, which does go from the East Mountains through Edgewood to Moriarty. And so it's basically an I-40 district starting East Mountains going all the way out to uh, Moriarty. And I have one more concept to get to here real quick. Concept D was an attempt to, uh, to take a look at the Native American population and Native American districts. Currently it's, it's difficult to get six Native American districts above 60% uh, Native American voting age population uh, sticking within plus or minus 5% deviation. And so this was an attempt to take get uh, five strong Native American voting age population districts where the voting age pop is over 65%. And that necessitated a sixth uh, district for the Native Americans, which was an influence district. So just over 30% Native American. In order for that to happen, the House 65 which is that influence district, they go and take some population out of Rio Rancho. And that did have some impact on the rest of the districts. So uh, Rio Rancho and Corrales and the West Side, they still have uh, a total of uh, 11 districts entirely within Rio Rancho on the West Side. And, um, and with one District 10 that crosses, but we still respect the river as a boundary, uh, almost all the way down to um, 
Rio Bravo. With some compact districts on the west side and the east side. Uh, one difference is that uh, House 24 gets moved around a little bit. Again, it's a different take, so you can see what could happen within the city of Albuquerque, where uh, in the previous plan, House 24 moved all the way to the west side. In this case, while we were straight out the lines uh, and trying to even out the population, uh, we ended up moving House 24 over to uh, Montgomery and San Mateo, basically, as its center. So uh, we can still, it's just an example of what can happen when you look at uh, using major roads, major boundaries as district lines, and it could have an impact on other districts. They might end up being moved to a different part of the city. And just to compare House 22 with this plan and the previous one, uh, in the previous plan, House 22 went from the East Mountains through Edgewood to Moriarty. In this case, the district removes Edgewood from House 22, and instead that uh, House 22 picks up to Warren's County. So you're able to swap uh, Edgewood for the rest of Moriarty, or excuse me, the rest of Torrance County. And House 50 in the Upper New Metro area does pick up, plus it does, it does go up to El Dorado and includes Edgewood. So that's a brief rundown of the four concepts within the Albuquerque area. Thank you. Questions? Michael, um, what happens to Isleta in, uh, in these maps? I know the concentration is the Albuquerque area, but um, for Isleta um, and concept A, B, I guess I'll see D. I mean, where, where is Isleta in terms of uh, eight and seven, seven and eight? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, Isleta, just for those who are in the audience, uh, I'll highlight it real quick. Isleta is made up of two precincts, and they're highlighted as I move the map, you can see how the precincts change uh, to a darker color. So Isleta within Burnley Up County is this one long gated precinct. And the other part is Mesa del Sol with the, uh, uh, the amphitheater. And the other part of this Isleta is within Valencia County. So within Valencia County, it's highlighted in a dark color. And then these little precincts in here, Bosque Farms as a, as a uh, sense of pr perspective. So within concept A, this letter is with House District 69, which is one of the Native American districts within this plan that stretches from Alamo uh, through Acoma Laguna and up into um, the Navajo Reservation. It does include Mesa del Sol, uh, within that Native American district. And, and 10 years ago, Mesa del Sol wasn't really in existence. The, the houses weren't there. Uh, but as time goes on, the houses have been built and uh, Burnley Hill County was able to actually split that off as its own precinct. So now we, it's nice to be able to draw a plan and include Mesa del Sol either in or out of the Native American district. Uh, Michael, Mr. Chairman, Michael, why wouldn't Mesa del Sol, which I don't think has much in common with this letter, be pushed into the Albuquerque and go up instead of coming down. I mean, is it a population issue? Is it uh, compactness? What, what, why would it be in this letter? I mean, what do they have in common? I guess is the question. Are you missing making movies? I don't miss the chair, Senator Sanchez. Uh, one reason is, is when we look at the population, that House 69 right now is at a negative 4.99% deviation. So one answer would be it needed that population in order to get within plus or minus 5%. Mr. Chairman and Michael, couldn't 69 get numbers from elsewhere other than, other than uh, up above? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Sanchez, that is certainly an option. It could, instead of going into Mesa del Sol, the challenge really for 69 in any of the Native American districts that are on the outside of the northwestern part of the state is when you start expanding the population, you start, start expanding the districts, uh, which population do you bring into a Native American district? And at this point, there aren't any uh, majority Native American precincts to bring into the northwest part of the state. So then it becomes a choice. Um, which districts on the edges do you bring into a Native American district? In this case, the choice was Mesa del Sol. We could certainly look into bringing in a, uh, an East Mountain precinct. So for example, you know, this precinct right here that's relatively small, 
you could look at bringing in any one of the precincts along the edge. Uh, this precinct is large, it's along the Rio Puerto. This is Tahajli right here. And this particular precinct is large in geographic area, but everybody within this precinct lives basically in the Mere Haven area. And so that's the choice is, well, what is that, what is that precinct you bring in? Do you bring in Mason Hill Soul? Do you add um, Mere Haven? Do you go into Rio Rancho? But at this particular moment, Rio Rancho does have a little bit, a little bit of Rio Rancho is in the Native American district within Concept A. Uh, the other options that have been explored are within uh, adding population, you could add another Valencia County precinct. This is a precinct on the southwestern part of the county, but all the population lives along the freeway, basically east of Lynn, or excuse me, west of Lynn. So you could take out Mesa del Sol, but then you might have to add in that population that's west of Lynn. Uh, you could go further into the South Valley, you could add so this precinct right here uh, has the um, uh, Bernalillo County Detention Center, and it also has part of the Pajarito Mesa. So instead of Mesa del Sol, perhaps you would take the rest of the Pajarito Mesa and put that into House 69. Okay, so 69, that is the, is the district that we're talking about is the Native American district. Correct. And in order to keep it that way, the population from Mesa del Sol makes it that, 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 that district, I guess, the population. That's correct. It had just enough population to get that district barely within plus or minus 5%. And if the deviation was different? If the deviation were different, it would be possible to take that out of House 69 and put it into a different district. Uh, the, the second set of questions I would need is in terms of the 7 and 8, uh, we didn't Valencia County didn't grow or it grew very slightly, correct? Right. Uh, but I think you said that 40 is coming into Valencia County on one of the maps. I think it was Concept B. District 40 coming into the south end of Valencia, I think you said. That is correct, yes. Today? Okay, go ahead. Oh, no, please. And so south end of Valencia is, is what? I can't tell by the map. Is that. Um, by the interchange, or is that down into Bosque and, and the Haral? Well, not the Haral, it's with the Bosque area. So the House 40 does come into Malena along Rankin. And, and it splits up the land, does it not? Correct. And then to go south through Haralis all the way down uh, to the county line. I think Bosque is in House 49. Is there is there any reason to split the land that way? One of the challenges we have is uh, District 7 and 8, as they currently exist, have just about the right population. Uh, there's not too much reason to change them unless they're affected by surrounding districts. And so our challenge is uh, if you draw a district on, say, the east side of the river, stay on the east side, so you can see it's 7 here, that it goes from Bosque Farms, follows the river all the way down to Rio Communities. And that's the perfect population for seven. Well, not perfect, but it has enough population there. Then you take eight and you work its way down from the county line south. And by the time you get to Bolin, it has enough population. And it's not possible to take all of Bolin and put it into eight because then Bolin would have too many people. And so there, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Well, west of the interchange is where the airport is, and there's some development, but not a lot of development. It's, it's the, the new airport that they have, and there's a lot of mobile homes, and, but it's it's not as populated as, it's a lot of land, but not a lot of population. And I'm wondering why we went, and, and we can't speak for the legislature 10 years ago, why uh, it went um, west, if I'm saying it correctly, instead of, of, of making Milan whole, I guess is the question. And I, and I know something in terms of the politics of it, what happened back when, because uh, the legislature was led by, in the House, Republicans had the, uh, the House uh, 
Democrats had the Senate and the Republicans had the, the governorship. And that was one that they couldn't agree to when they went to court eventually. Wasn't that the case? I think I yeah, think both of you were there. Brian says yes. Well, one challenge that we have is Valencia County has 76,000 people uh, with respect to the 2020 census. And if each house district is roughly 30,000 people, that leaves 16,000 16, extra. Where does that extra 16,000 people go? If you, wanted, if, a, if you wanted to create a plan that took Berlin and put it all of Berlin into a single district, then, and just as an example, you, you put all of Berlin into eight, leave seven alone, well, that means that the district eight would be too big. We'd have 15, 10, 15,000 too many people. Where does that, where does that population go into? Do you take, uh, say, House 49 and, and go north through the Berlin Airport and go into, say, Los Lunas? Uh, you know, that, that extra 15,000 has to go somewhere. And in this particular plan, if you draw two districts from the northern boundary of Valencia County, then that leaves that 15,000 in the southern part to be put into some other district. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and I, just as a, as a note, as an example with respect to um, Concept C in the House, Mesa del Sol was put into uh, a South Valley House District 10. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions? Public comment? Um, Chairman Travis and Member Sanchez, just a reminder that Governor Sanchez from the Soto Pueblo talked more um, in the last paragraph of the first page of the letter that he sent that I forward to all of you about the preferences of the set of public related to that split. All right, so we have up Mason Graham. Thanks for being patient, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Mason Graham I'm with the Mexico Black Voters Collaborative. Uh, thank you so much for allowing Dr. Charles McNell to give uh, opening presentation about the historic significance of African Americans here in New Mexico. Uh, the last committee meeting that took place on August 14th at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center uh, argued that in order to comply with the requirement of maintaining communities of interest, the committee must consider the Black and African American communities of New Mexico who continue to be undercounted and underrepresented here. The recommendation from the committee uh, that came from Ms. Curtis uh, was to identify the areas where we have Black and African American communities of interest and locate opportunities where we can increase representation on the map. So I want to thank Chairman Chavez and Member Robert Radigan for having conversations with us after the fact uh, with our organization, providing some very important information on the, on the process and how we can be successful in our endeavors to create a proposal that is representative of the Black and African American communities in New Mexico, and that's what I'm going to be testifying and presenting to you all today. So since that meeting in August, the New Mexico Black Voters Collaborative and the New Mexico Black Central Organizing Committee, who's here today, worked together to create a working group of Black and African American community members and organizations where our purpose was to identify the communities of our state which could benefit the most from redistricting. So our goal was twofold to ensure that the Black and African-American communities gained or increased their power and representation within districts where possible, and to preserve areas where Black and African-Americans have built community and existing representation. So from these goals, we identified that House District 19, the International District in Albuquerque, House District 63 and 64 in Clovis, House District 61 and 62 in Hobbs, and House District 51 in Alamogordo presented the most opportunities for Black and African American representation, growth, and maintenance. And during uh, Dr. Becknell's presentation earlier, you probably now have a better understanding of the historical significance of the African American communities in those cities. So I did submit a map proposal this morning. Um, I could have you pull that up as I go through these points. Um, it's labeled NMBBC Black Communities slash House Districts. Yeah, 
kind of fun, right? <laughs> All right. So we'll begin with House District 19. And so during this testimony, I want to reiterate that, you know, the African American experience isn't uh, defined by our small population numbers. And a lot of the times you would hear the argument that we are just this percentage or that percentage of the population. And today I won't be saying any of that. I will be recognizing us as individuals and residents in the community as such. So beginning with House District 19, we wanted to ensure that the over 1,600 Black and African American residents were able to maintain their representation within the International District. Uh, we want to thank the committee for only proposing MAP concepts that maintain the International District as House District 19. Uh, but we identified that it was concept B, which was proposed, included the highest percentage of Black and African American residents within District 19, and we included those lines on our map. However, on CRC concept B, we recognize that Representative Pamela Herndon, who's the state representative for House District 28, would no longer reside in her district by removing the Chelwood Park area, which is east of Wantabell and north of Mountain Road. Representative Herndon is one of three Black legislators in, the New, in New Mexico, and losing her in the House would be a serious blow to our representation of Black and African Americans at the state level. Our recommendation would be to include the Chelwood Park area in House District 28, which is reflected in your concept C and D. The only issue is that we recognize that in concepts A, C, and D, that the Black and African American population slightly decreases in District 19. So we would argue that we want to maintain the highest density of Black and African American residents in District 19, the International District, as possible in order to maintain the International District as a Black community of interest. In House District 63 and 64, so I'll give them a second to move over there, which is Clovis. Our proposal, as well as your proposal in concept C, maintain the Black community of interest population numbers equally in both districts. Uh, you hear, you, um, the city of Clovis have roughly 2,000 Black and African American residents, which get divided equally between House District 63 and 64, giving both districts a unique, a unique opportunity to have equal Black and African American representation for the city of Clovis. So our recommendation would be to maintain this equality between House District 63 and 64 Clovis in order to maintain the existing Black and African American community of interest and allow for equal representation in both districts. Districts We really don't see this um, anywhere else on the map. Um, there's a couple of other areas in Albuquerque that do have um, an increase of African American population like in, on the west side or in Rio Rancho, but this opportunity here in Clovis that you see really encompasses the importance that Dr. Becknell was talking about, the Air Force Base being there and a lot of African-American society that settled there. But because it is divided in between two districts, we can keep our representation as high as possible split between the two. For House District 61 and 62, which is the city of Hobbs, we decided to compact District 61 from the north and include the precinct that is north of West Carlsbad Highway. There are 128 Black and African American residents that live in that precinct right there um, on the left side of your cursor right there. Um, this is currently split uh, on the current map uh, into District 62, which separates the Black and African American population of Hobbs between 61 and 62. But by moving the boundary of 61 South and the addition of the precinct uh, that previously existed in District 62, we maintain the majority 1,300 Black and African Americans that reside in the city of Hobbs within one district. That would be District 61. Uh, compacting 61 South to exclude Lovington also increases the population density of Black and African American residents in 61, which we feel is more indicative of the communities that reside in Hobbs while increasing Black and African American representation, which previously was being diluted by the inclusion of the city of Lovington. Uh, and we see this change is also reflected on your CRC map concept B. And lastly, we recognize that House District 51, 
that includes the city of Alamogordo has approximately 1,480 Black and African American residents. While concepts proposed by the CRC do not significantly decrease that number, the addition of neighboring districts and areas does dilute the Black and African American population density, therefore lowers opportunity for equal representation of Black and African Americans that would fall within the neighboring districts, which are 52 and 56. And we would argue that the city of Alamogordo be contained within one district in order to reflect the entirety of Black and African American communities in the city. That's how it appears now on the current house maps. Um, but in all of your proposals, I do see that it gets split uh, between 56 and uh, 52. So once again, I would like to thank you all for giving the Black and African American community an opportunity to be represented in this meeting. And your recommendations so far have been pretty inclusive of, of us. I think we've heard some great um, recommendations about congressional maps as well as incre increasing ethnic majority um, on, the, on the ethnic maps, which we definitely support. Um, these are the recommendations that we propose, and like I mentioned, has been submitted in district there. Uh, but I do want to end by reminding the committee that Black and African American New Mexicans have been historically excluded from these kinds of conversations and decisions that have serious implications on our communities. Um, we are continually told that our numbers are too small and insignificant to create an impact in our state. This is a dangerous way of thinking that continues to disenfranchise us, deny us from equal representation, and minimize the over 42,000 Black and African Americans they call New Mexico their home. This is why we demand that the committee understand the seriousness that comes with choosing a map that does maintain our community populations in the highest percentage as possible and recognize that regardless of how small the number may seem, there are individuals who have been seriously impacted by decisions that have been made at meetings like this in the past. So thank you for your time and I'll stand for questions. Questions? Yes. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. and. Um, Quite frankly, I really appreciate your explanation. It was very clear as to why you're making the various proposals. The only one I guess that I do not quite understand is the Clovis era, 63, 64, and why you would want to keep essentially four and a half percent in each, as opposed to increasing um, representation in one, if it's possible. And I'm, I have no idea if it's possible or not. From what we've seen is that because of the population of Clovis, that is not really as possible to maintain within the deviation um, by making Clovis all one district, which I think is why it's split between 63 and 64 now. The way that the map is drawn now is from one of your concept maps, um, which we kind of worked off of. Um, none of. Nobody in our group is a cartographer or map expert. Uh, so we did have to kind of steal a little bit of what you had. Um, so, uh, which was reflected in your map concept B. Uh, so that's why we drew the lines this way. Thank you. Mason, do you want your remarks to be submitted as written testimony? Uh, I think we've written uh, some, submitted some written testimony already as well. Yeah, but uh, on the map, I did provide a brief explanation, um, but I could submit the longer one as well. Yeah, we, we would welcome that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Alexandria Willie Taylor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Alexandria Taylor, and I'm a member of the New Mexico Black Central Organizing Committee. I was born and raised in Alamogordo. My great grandparents moved to Alamogordo in the mid 40s. My great grandparents um, built a life and a legacy for our family that was built on our family thriving. I knew no other way of being than to thrive. My great grandmother, Lottie Mae Taylor, served at the General's House on Holloman Air Force Base, raised many babies in that house catered to many leaders from around the country and from our armed services, that at her, at her home going service, the church that has my, grand, my great grandfather's name etched on the outside as one of the founding deacons, was packed with all of the now adults who she had raised, celebrating her life. 
to this day, if you go to Alto Eduardo and you say Carmel Taylor and someone went to Chaparral Junior High during the time that she was the kitchen director there, they will talk about my grandmother's Thanksgiving dinners and how her dressing is like none other you have ever had. My mom was the chief juvenile probation and parole officer in Otero County, which means that my childhood meant I could do nothing. <laughs> I share that because New Mexico is the place that I know to call home. As a descendant of stolen people living on stolen land, New Mexico is the only place I know to call home and to be invisibilized by statistics when I come from a family and have chosen to now raise my son here and my sister has chosen to raise her kids here that represents five generations of Taylors in New Mexico. I'm so grateful for Dr. Reverend Dr. McNeil because having that oral history which is native to us, having that oral history on the record in this process is so critical. We have to know about the contributions that Black Americans have made to this beautiful state. And so Mason has presented mapped concepts that I want you to know represent us coming together. They represent us learning from the lessons of our elders, like Dr. McNeil and my grandparents, knowing how involved they have been in politics and policy and community. And that those maps represent what's important to us. And I ask you to pay attention to the detail of why we submitted the maps with the interest that we did, because it's important to us. I just wanna leave and share this one quote from a scholar and practitioner, Janelle Kubitsch, who says, we are not minorities, we have been minoritized, and we are, not under, we are not underrepresented, we have been systematically excluded. And because she is my sorority sister and colleague and friend, I know you all said you don't pay attention to where current representatives are when you're drawing the House district, but we must maintain Representative Pamela Herndon in her district. That representation is so critical to those of us who have not always felt represented in the very hall of the legislature that we work in. Thank you. I I, uh, I know Alexandria, she's one of my favorite people that I work with. There is nobody that does more for this state, standing up for, especially for women who've been sexually assaulted than this woman right there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Next we have Ms. Andrea Colorado. We will receive some written comments as well right before the meeting. I can email them to you. Hi, good evening. My name is Andrea Calderon. I am a data analyst and I'm working in collaboration with the um, New Mexico Black Voters Collaborative. Um, I'm gonna be going into some data that just adds a little bit of nuance uh, to the maps that we're drawing and the considerations that are underway with the redistricting process. Mm -hmm. um, next slide, please. All right, so the data I'm talking about is actually, um, it uses a national standard called a social vulnerability index. The social vulnerability index measures social determinants of health. They use 15 different factors um, in a framework that was developed by the Center for Disease Control and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease uh, Registry. 
Um, the 15 factors are compiled into four different themes, socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, minority status and language, and housing type and transportation. Each of these themes are given a score for every single census tract in the state. Um, there are county scores and there's an overall score for the state itself. There's also an overall score designated for each tract, county, and the state. Thank you. So here, um, what we see is the overall social vulnerability map for the city of Albuquerque. Um, we see clusters of high vulnerability areas in the international district up near Balloon Fiesta Park in central Albuquerque and southeast Albuquerque. I mean, southwest, excuse me. Um, this map actually layers um, the African-American population on top of social vulnerability. Um, and so what we see is that we actually have a significant concentration of African-American community members that are in the northern part of the state and the southern uh, part of a really highly vulnerable area near Balloon Fiesta Park. We have a high density of the population in the International District. And collectively, we have a pretty significantly high population um, in southwestern Albuquerque um, moving out into the county. Next slide. Okay. So in this map, I basically, um, I used the threshold of 150 individuals and focused on the most concentrated areas um, of African-American density in the city. Um, I wanted to focus in a little bit on the international district. Um, so this map actually just includes um, high density data. Um, and this is one of the most socially vulnerable areas in the city, right? Um, and I guess originally what we were looking for was, uh, and, and, I, and I see that a lot of the um, concept maps actually maintain District 19 as it had previously been. Um, but we really wanted you to see that the vulnerability of the east side of District 19 is significantly greater than that on the west side of District 19. So if you were to move the line um, or that population over into the adjacent district, you would essentially be clumping really highly social, socially vulnerable communities together. And if you were moving the other side of the district to the west, you would be uh, basically clumping communities that aren't affected by social determinants of health as much. Um, this in, you know, in essence would create a gerrymandering situation, which um, we might want to avoid. But if we keep the district completely together and we continue to have African-American representation of it, then we'll essentially be um, re, you know, maintaining the, the status as it is. Um, now, where, now also I, I shall note that even though um, you would be increasing social vulnerability if you were to move that part of the district over, you would also be increasing African-American um, sort of voter uh, density if, if you did do that. Um, so in Southwest Albuquerque, um, you know, we also have really socially dense um, at social, socially vulnerable areas um, that are mostly south of the highly dense African-American community areas. Um, next slide, please. And then, and then here we have um, the like sort of what the northwest section. I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. But what the northwest section of the city looks like. So we have very low, um, high density areas of African American communities. In the northeast portion of the city, the most highly dense African American communities are on the west side of this um, of this part of the map. Um, again, it's in that area that is adjacent or holds Balloon Fiesta Park. Um, there is pretty high vulnerability, and we're going to see these broken down in a couple of, uh, you know, in the four themes that I actually covered at the beginning more. So I'm not going to talk about this map so, so much. Next slide, please. Okay, and actually we can move to the next one. Yes, please. All right, so here is an overview of um, the impacts on the international district. Um, if we were to move the population over to the east, um, and then if we were to you know, move half of the population over to the west. Next slide. 
So, you know, moving away from percentages, I just wanted to point out the numbers of African American residents in these different house districts. District, District 12 has 618 residents um, that identify as Black and African American. House District 13 has 997, 14, 643, 16, 850, 26, 889, 68, 870, and District 23, 610. So these are all areas where we have really highly vulnerable communities. And I just wanted to give you a snapshot of who's being affected and, and in which way. Next slide, okay. Um, actually, you can go to the next one, that's fine. Thank you, okay. So this is uh, one of the four themes in which the overall score is broken down into so socioeconomic conditions on the west side of town, since that's the area where we're looking to increase our, or um, change the um, sort of where the lines are drawn and increase representation there with the growing population. So the census tracks that the worst socioeconomic conditions on the west side are scattered through districts 14, 12, and 11. And then median to high social vulnerability exists to a great extent in District 13, 14, District 11, and 26. There are patches of medium to high vulnerability in District 16 and District 68, um, as well as Delegate Garrett's district. So I'm breaking it down with household, household age and disability. Um, we also uh, this is a pretty, I don't know, it's, it's on the one page, or sorry, I just, um, but it actually, uh, you can see sort of the distribution of households with uh, more seniors, um, children, um, and then people with, that are over the age of five that are experiencing disability, as well as single parent households. Um, we see a pretty high concentration on, on the right of the African-American community um, highlighted in this socially vulnerable area in the central part of the west side um, that's visible on this map, um, as well as the southeastern part of the west side, of the southwestern part, excuse me. Okay. Um, here we look at minority status and language on the west side. So this is sort of, um, uh, this map was um, a little bit less relevant because um, the minority count um, within um, the social vulnerability index includes African-American counts, right? So on the right side of this PowerPoint, you can see um, we are depicting that in a different way with the, with the orange circles as a different layer um, to point that out. So just a little bit of redundancy there, but it does clump it with um, residents that speak English less than well. Housing type and transportation is also something to consider and something that's included in the social vulnerability index. Um, we, this includes multifamily homes, mobile homes, um, group quarters, as well as overcrowding and no access to transportation. So on this slide um, and on your one pager, I've broken down at the bottom the four different parts um, of the west side that have highly vulnerable areas. Um, it, yes, so in District 23, uh, the, and the south central portion of District 16, we have a highly vulnerable area with this theme, um, the northern part of District 26, the northern north central part and the southeastern portion of District 14, and the northeastern portion of District 12. So that's it for me. I know that was a lot of information. I'm happy to provide an extra training if that's needed. Um, this is, um, uh, you know, like I said, a national standard that cities are using across the country to really look a little bit more closely at issues of equity that go beyond simply race and ethnicity and poverty levels. Um, now in Albuquerque, we have many more layers of information that we can contribute to this um, to measure displacement, migration, right? What's occurring um, along themes of development, food access, access to green spaces, all of that. But um, and some cities have actually created that. Um, we're looking forward to the opportunity to do that. Um, but so far, this is uh, the framework that's been leading our um, understanding of who is the most socially vulnerable in the city and in the state. Thank you. Where does the data come from? The data is um, pulled from census information. So we're using the 2018 five-year ACS estimates for this map because the 2020 census data has not been 
uh, released yet that you know, has all of the categories of data that we need. Um, it also uses African-American density data from the 2020 release. Okay, within New Mexico, where do they get the data? Where does the Census Bureau get the data? Is it health department, human services? From the census process. Mr. Chair, the, the ACS, the American Community Survey, so it's a, a survey that's sent to a sample of households on a rolling basis throughout the decade and captures socioeconomic questions that the decennial census does not. Thank you. So uh, first, thank you for your um, presentation and your training. Uh, and I guess the, the question I had is, in addition to looking at the vulnerabilities, are you also looking at an, an asset map? Uh, communities as well, so that you can pair the challenges with what your the strengths that you're building on as well. Absolutely, um, that's something that we use for internal um, purposes. The reason that this is even named social vulnerability is because it was developed by uh, for addressing emergency, you know, situations. So if there's flooding, if there are hurricanes, um, um, any sort of emergency management situation um, is is how you know that is why they've chosen the specific um, themes and uh, factors that they have in order to sort of estimate how much how if it would be harder to serve populations in these census tracts or if it would be easier to serve them right and so those that are in more vulnerable um, areas um, would be harder to support and uh, be able to evacuate in emergency situations. They would have to have more intensive support services um, in order to you know, serve the kind of conditions that folks are living in. So do you have this information for it? I mean, can you give us like a, a color version of this map for the state? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would really appreciate that. Sure. Would you, would you like it? Well, I can touch base later, but I'm happy to layer African-American density on that as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Next, we have Ms. Nicole Rogers, and I also just wanted to acknowledge while Nicole's coming up that Representative Figueroa, who is one of the co-sponsors of the legislation that made this possible, and Shandy Dit Fiercely is here. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nicole Rogers, and I live in the International District here in Albuquerque. And today I'm providing public comment with my um, family here um, to talk specifically about the African American community. During the 2020 census, we worked really hard collaboratively to increase the uh, count for the African-American community. We focused on seven cities specifically that we knew we had um, our community that maybe just wasn't counted. We are excited because we, that work paid off. In places like Hobbs, we saw an almost 30% increase in our population. And it wasn't because we weren't already there, we just weren't counted, right? And so now the difference is we can't stop that work. We had to interject ourselves in the census process to be included, and we're doing that again with redistricting. What I'd like to ask is we talked about equity and I heard from the Democratic Party about wanting equity, but part of equity is making sure we have representation at this table. Okay, and so I don't see that, and we'd like to see that going forward. I know we can't fix that now, but we have 10 more years to figure it out to get it right for next time. We are here, we have been here. I was born and raised in New Mexico. I was born in Las Vegas, New Mexico. My grandfather was the state fire marshal of this wonderful state. I understand what representation means. And I understand being mixed that my part of my heritage is not represented in the state because we have the tricultural men. We are not a tricultural state. We're a multicultural state. And that includes people like me people like my brothers and sisters sitting behind me. We all know that these districts are drawn to shape what happens in our communities for the next 10 years. I sat in on some of the Zoom meetings previously and I really love that you were focused on making sure you heard from the Native American community. I think I heard, um, I think it was Michael Sanchez say over and over and over again, 
we need to make sure we hear from the Native American community. We want the same. We want for what before you and Dr. Matt, you say, did we hear from the Black community? And if not, let's make sure we get that input as well, because we are here. We aren't going anywhere. We love this state. Just like Dr. McNeil said earlier, we have influence in this state, but we want to be a part of these processes. So thank you for the opportunity to tell, tell our story and make sure you understand that we are here and we want a seat at that table next time. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Erica Davis Crump. Allergies. <laughs> all the things outside. Oh my gosh, I swear it's just allergies. Excuse me, bear with me with this, these sniffles. I really just need some Benadryl, y'all. Um, Hi, it's so good to see you all. My name is Erica Davis Crow. I am with the New Mexico Black Central Organizing Committee. Um, and New Mexico Black Women's Club and these wonderful individuals here today. I kind of wrote stuff down because, you know, we'll be up here just having a conversation. We don't have time for that. Um, I want to take a minute and say thank you all. And also, thanks for the break, but let's all take a deep breath because this is a lot. Um, and I am up here in support of the maps that Mason has presented. I think that they're really, really wonderful. I too am a native Black Bukenya. I am 35 and I have decided to raise my babies here. And I thought about this redistricting process and how my baby boy, my baby baby, 13. And the next time that we would have this moment to carve out representation, he will be 23. I also need to embrace myself because I'm going through it with that, but also um, just thinking about how we are literally dream casting the future in this space. And as we do that with deep intention, I want to honor this man who's standing, who's sitting next to me because I heard you on the last Zoom call, how you spoke with such reverence for our indigenous relatives and the way that they held space. And just as Nicole mentioned, I pray and hope that after today, you take that map that Mason has provided into deep consideration and sincerity um, so that you can say that you heard from us. We understand all of the little things that happen within each of our communities, right? Um, and a lot of times the rhetoric is the black community might not be united. Well. We have demystified that for you today. And we are also doing some multi-generational work for the first time. And um, I'm an SCC member. I am a co-founder of the New Mexico Black Coalition, uh, Black Central Organizing Committee. I ran communications point on about six bills last year. Uh, I'm in this because I am choosing to make New Mexico my home because I don't know nothing else. Um, I don't really want to. I know we're at the bottom of the barrel for many things, but I think that this opportunity presents a very beautiful moment for us to shape shift that future into what we know it could be. 